severe life dr maipal sir will start the introduction of the uh, webinar thank you very much uh, uh, dr rohit om prakash and welcome to this uh, webinar on surgical strike uh, uh, regarding phaco emulsification uh, organized by the all india ophthalmological society uh, we have great uh, orators great uh, academicians great uh, researchers from uh, across the world and i wish to profusely thank them uh, for having joined us in this webinar uh this is going to be a uh, certain case presentations uh, and certain presentations that are going to be made by prominent faculty and then there'll be a panel discussion as to how one uh, approaches the problem and uh, how one would have approached it slightly differently so i think uh, uh, with this uh, brief introduction i wish to welcome you all to the series of webinars that all india ophthalmological society has undertaken and i wish to thank uh, uh, professor namrata sharma for Uh, and other members of the governing council rajesh sinha uh, scientific committee chairman academic research all of them have really participated uh, uh, and have kept the members of uh, the all india ophthalmological society engaged i think uh, uh, in the adversity of covid uh, this is an opportunity to catch up with the, the foreign uh, uh, faculty and uh, be uh, still remain ahead on the skill sets the academics etc so i think uh, welcome once again to this uh, session which is uh, uh, largely put together by rohit om prakash and uh, gaurav and uh, we will start with this uh, and i'll uh, pass it back to dr rohit om prakash to continue with this webinar thank you dr mahipal for uh, the, for the introduction so i would be uh, you know we have with us uh, i would be uh sharing the moderation with none other than uh, gaurav luthra who is executive director at drishti i i institute dehradun he is the worthy son of a worthy uh, father he is the chairman academics iirsi cataract and refractive surgeon uh, he is he has presented over 100 papers lectures in international and over 2200 papers in national conferences he is equally efficient in live surgeries and with his presentations and his judge in apacrs i have the proud privilege of introducing none other than david chang you know to for i just say it like this that there are certain people for whom their signature becomes their autograph and for ophthalmology i would say david is up there well he's an ophthalmologist at los altos california he has been in the top par list since 2014 twice in top 5 well two indians have been into this top category uh, dr amar and dr abhay and he dr david has always been there he has authored five phaco emulsification textbooks co-editor in more than 10 of ophthalmology textbooks ifis is his invention and there are so many which would be going into too many of details he has more than 130 peer reviewed publications he has won all the reward awards ridley 2020 ao kelman lecture binghorst lecture and he has been the ex president of ascrs i welcome uh, david and i thank him for getting up early on a sunday morning to be with us next we have i have the proud privilege of uh, introducing the 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 woman uh, ophthalmologist in india she is from professor R, from rp center she is a professor at rp center delhi fellowship she did from moorfields honorary general secretary of all india ophthalmological society she has two patents to her name she is a senior she has a senior achievement award in the american academy of ophthalmology she has been an international ophthalmologist education award recipient at ao and has more than 450 publications and has authored 11 books dr gaurav could you take over from here unmute gaurav we can't hear you okay uh thanks a lot uh, dr uh, rohit om prakash sir for uh, inviting me to you know co-moderate with you and uh, it's a privilege and uh, thanks for ios to you know in organize this uh, webinar and i think uh, before we uh, go on to the first speaker uh, there is a short film which uh, 
we will be sharing uh, which is you know this is a session organized with the help of uh, klb mm -hmm. and i will be can you so you can you stop sharing your everybody screen? for that matter yeah the panelists for that matter I, do you want me to introduce now sir or should we introduce yeah, as yeah, we yeah, yeah so let's introduce the panelists at least first all right all right so i'll just share my uh, screen first i have shared it already if you can all right yeah perfect sir thank you so much and uh, so uh, you know uh, it's been uh, we've have we have an amazing uh, lineup of our panelists you know, dr rohit already introduced uh, dr david chang from our international panel and uh, dr namrata and dr maypal sir Uh, Dr. Richard Packard uh, is a dear friend. Uh, we, I've learned so much from him. He's senior consultant at Arnott I Associates in London, and he started using uh, fake emulsification in 1979. And uh, he inserted the world's first folded uh, soft IOL during a rabbit study. And um, in 1990, he implanted the very first uh, Acrisoft IOL. And he's a past board member of ESCRS uh, from. Uh, way back in 1999 to 2007, and since 2000, he's been chairman of the judges for the ESCRS video competition. We all keenly attend that uh, every year, and he delivered the uh, Binghorst lecture uh, in 2015, which is one of the uh, most uh, prestigious uh, lectures. And he's been a teacher for me. I've learned so much from him over the years. He's been part of my instruction courses at the ESCRS a few years back. Then I have the you know privilege of introducing somebody who's one of the most dynamic personalities i find um, you know amongst my friends seniors and in aios and in ophthalmology somebody who's again been instrumental in uh, you know giving me a lot of personally and to all ophthalmologists in india he's the president of the all india ophthalmic society uh, dr mahipal singh sajdev one of our most dynamic uh, ophthalmologists he is chairman of the center for sight group of uh, hospitals uh, awarded the padma shri by the one of the highest honors by the president of india and chairman scientific committee of the irsi at present and a past chairman of the aios as well he has over 100 peer reviewed publications uh, and he has amazing foresight into upcoming new technologies and i always trust his judgment so dr maypal sir thank you for uh, joining us and then again uh, another dear friend and uh, somebody who's uh, been uh, keenly involved with uh, active teaching and uh, bringing up the standards of indian ophthalmology uh, dr partha biswas who's director of the bbi foundation in calcutta he's uh, the current chairman uh, the new chairman scientific committee of the aios and we look forward to uh, tremendous work from dr partha he was the past chairman academics and research committee of the aios uh, for two consecutive terms of 3 years and he is the pioneer of the court martial in ophthalmology which uh, took india by storm and still continues to do that uh, another uh, panelist and um, i may add here a dear friend and a tennis partner although he practices in delhi but dr bharti is a keen tennis player before uh, i will call him uh, as uh, as one of the most renowned ophthalmologists one of the pioneers of refractive surgery uh, in india and so your slides are really small but i'll still try to <laughs> read them he started refractive surgery way back in 1986 and uh, he's also been a pioneer of uh, fake emulsification uh, way back in 1994 when i started my journey in uh, private practice uh, he was one of our keen teachers he started alk in 1995 lasik in 98 one of the first surgeons to start lasik in uh, delhi and in india fem to lasik way back in 2007 Uh, also doing laser cataract surgery since 2008 and uh, started doing smile in 2019 he's a recipient of so many awards the prestigious ps hardy award from the ios the sadguru st award 2015 the t agarwal gold medal the krishna sohan singh trophy for the dos in 3 can 3 years dr pandya oration in 2006 he has been a past president of dos in 2007 and 8 and a past president of the irsi 2014 and he is an amazing tennis player let me add that again Uh, he's beaten me a couple of times in some of our tournaments so with that uh, i think uh, i've been able to introduce the panelists and uh, i'll pass on to dr rohit to i think please. dr tetyal would be uh, he's here luckily so he would be uh, <laughs> getting the ball rolling you know so he, uh, he he's professor at rp center aims and he has more than 300 indexed publications four textbooks textbooks padam shri award and he has two patents to his name he would be talking about intraoperative oct uh, role in posterior polar cataracts over to dr js detail sir uh, dr rohit can i show that uh, short film which uh, our uh, no, session yeah. organizer wanted me to wanted us to show uh, before dr tatyal speaks so i'll just share screen for 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 30 second for half a minute um, A 
Introducing the Actis SP from Nidec, a single-piece hydrophobic aspheric IOL made in Japan. A stable and steady structure is formed within the polymer molecule through a unique manufacturing process called double polymerization, reducing the incidence of glistening and subsurface nanoglistening. It features a square edge around the full 360 degree circumference of the lens, including the point of haptic junction with a small gap. This enhances bonding of the IOL surface to the posterior capsule, minimizing the risk of posterior capsule opacification. Blast finishing on the haptic surface improves visibility and prevents the haptic from sticking to the optical surface while the lens is folded. In addition, it enables faster unfolding when injecting the lens into the capsule. An arc length of over 8 millimeters enables a wider contact area between the IOL haptic and the capsular bag. The distance between the haptic shoulders is 9.5 millimeters. The SZ1 and SZ1C are sophisticated preloaded systems. Actis SP IOL. <laughs> And uh, all over to you, Dr. Tityal, sir. We saw you on TV, national television today, a few hours back. Yes, uh, please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Rohit. Am I audible? Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Rohit, uh, for giving me this opportunity and, uh, and uh, being an opening uh, batsman today. I think uh, all surgeons do have challenging days and challenging situations. Posterior polar cataracts are one of them which really puts surgeons into sometimes difficult uh, situations. So we need to understand these cases carefully. And we know that there is around 8 to 36% uh, chance of a PC rupture or a PC dehiscence happening during the uh, uh, phaco surgery in these cases. But we all know the highest incidence of PC opening happens after we finish the nucleotomy. In fact, when you do an epicortical cushion removal, that is the time that the uh, PC opens up. And the surgical techniques have been well described uh, by previous uh, literature. And avoid hydrodissection, that is a dictum for these cases. Hydrodetonation carefully should be done in these cases. And design your epicortical cushion and do a slow motion layer by layer FACO in these patients. But there's a question of uh, hydrodissection for these patients always. There are surgeons who will do hydrodissections in all cases of posterior polar cataract also, because it does decrease the journalist stress. There's a free rotation of a nucleus, leaves the epinuclear cushion till the end. The aspiration of epinuclear cushion become very, very safe. There is no addition left uh, towards the end. Uh, the PC is uh, the loose part of PC, central part of PC can be taken up uh, lightly with aspiration in these cases. So how do we decide uh, hydrodissection? Hydrodelineation, yes, we all know it has to be done. Yes or no, the decision would be based on a pre-op assessment on slit lamp, ASOCT, or exams or other eye, or intraoperatively using IOCT for your cases. So basically, this is the picture we, which we see in a posterior polar cataracts. No way we can uh, really look into the integrity of posterior capsule in these cases, especially with the hardened nucleus in these group of cases. And this is a definite case of PC opening where we know that uh, hydrodissection has not to be done in these cases. So what we look in a ASOCT or IOCT microscopes is two different ways to look in these cases. OCT, ASOCT will give you a pre-op uh, picture of these cases. IOCT will give you an intraoperative dynamics of uh, surgery in each step of these posterior polar cataract. So this is what we see in an anti-second OCT or posterior polar cataract, we look into two areas, one is the central area and peripheral area, the disc of opacity in these cases. And see this, uh, central area is clearly delineated and this is the area which is not clearly delineated, the PC in this case. This is uh, nothing is visible beyond the uh, opacity in posterior polar cataracts. This is the open posterior capsule in these cases. So today I'm going to take you through our publication which is going to come in JCRS on 
on the Iowa City guided free communication in positive polar cataracts, where we are looking for the actual dynamics of hydro procedure or hydro delineation in these cases. So we had ruled out all cases of uh, open posterior capsule in these cases. Other group of cases, we are divided into three categories, type one, type two, and type three uh, posterior polar cataracts. Type one, the posterior polar cataract in, and in uh, IOCT picture. The IOCT picture also uh, collaborated well with the anti-second OCT pictures. That's a good thing in these cases. You can see there's a clear delineation of posterior capsule from the opacity. And there's a hypo clear space between the PC and this uh, disc. So this is type one type of posterior polar cataract. Type two posterior polar cataract, the periphery is delineated, but center area is not clearly delineated, the posterior capsule and the opacity relationship in these cases. Type three type of posterior polar cataract, where you have a denser nucleus uh, mass in these cases, of posterior polar opacity, nothing can uh, visualize in the right from the periphery to center. So these are type three type of posterior polar cataracts. Just to see a video how uh, we do in a type 1 cataract, in all type 1 cataract, after doing a uh, hydro uh, capsular axis, we did a hydro delineation, one wave, and this is a second wave uh, being done. You can see a clear space of hydro delineation, leaving a thick epical particle cushion in these cases, and the post CPC is intact in such cases. In all cases of uh, type 1 cataract, we did a hydro dissection also. You can see I'm doing hydro dissection here. You can see a clear wave of hydro dissection fluid coming out, which is separating the epicortical cushion from the posterior capsule. You can see this is hydro delineation. This is hydro dissection in these cases. And PC was intact. So this is what we saw in type 1 cataracts. In type 2 cataract, we avoided doing hydro dissection. We just did a hydro delineation. But this is one case I want to show, despite being a type 2, Inadvertently, the fluid, this you can see how is the delineation happening with the hydro dissection. This is what you can see. And as soon as we decompress, the space will go down. So, and PC is intact here. So by mistake, when I bring a second nothing, there's a hydro dissection happening in this particular case. And there's a PC going backwards. So these cases, I could still see the PC, which is clearly integrated. Therefore, surgery was simple uh, subsequently in these cases. You can see this is the end of surgery. I'm taking out the epicortical cushion, this particular case, and see the intact posterior capsule is visible uh, in entirety center to periphery in these cases. So this is a type two, three type of posterior polar cataract in IOCT, large disc of uh, opacity, not allowing the discretion of looking how uh, posterior pole is in these cases. We do just a hydro delineation. You can see a delineation being done. Slightly harder nucleus, the deletion will be larger in such cases. But after doing delineation, you can see that we already got cushion in this particular case. This is the one delineation line, the second delineation line, and posterior capsule is well intact in these cases. Subsequently, you can do a, a good uh, emulsification. The PC is intact. You can see PC intactness is visible here. The aspiration of epicortical cushion, we always give the direction first take out from periphery, leave to the center. And towards the end, remove the entire uh, bulk of epicortical uh, cushion so that you leave the posterior capsule intact in these patients. So if you summarize the entire type 1, type 2, type 3, which we saw, type 1 is the one, almost 50% of cases are type 1 variety. There no distinct PC clearance can be seen. No chances of uh, rupture. No case had a PC rupture in, in any step of surgery. Type 2 is around 30%, type 3 around 22% of cases. One case in type 2 and one two cases in the type 3 had a posterior capsular dissection uh, when we are doing a cortical aspirin in these cases. Therefore, we know that type 2, type 3 cases will have a higher chances of uh, PC dissection. So assessment is very, very important for these cases, pre-op and intra-op assessment. And if you have IOCT, that makes things much easier. You have a posterior polar cataract. You are doing a femtosecond laser. Beautiful article published by Dr. Mahipal Group where you can assess the entire thing like IOCT in these cases also when you're planning the femtosecond laser application. You can see the dissections of posterior capsule or intact of posterior capsule in these cases. This is our, my technique of uh, doing uh, three rings of safety and uh, eight chops makes the uh, you know, nucleus in multiple small, small uh, fragments which can be taken out very effectively without causing too much stress in these cases. This is how it looks like subsequently. The femtosecond will give you a much more uh, similar appearance in these cases. To summarize the posterior polar cataract, IOCT is definitely helpful because it gives a real-time assessment for an entire step of surgery and you can safeguard complications very nicely. I would say both slit lab and anti OCT should be done. 
OCT Pictures also nicely collaborate with IOCT Pictures. So if you're OCT done, you know what type of post polar you have, a subsequent surgery can be planned in these cases. So hydro, no hydro will be based on our basically the clear uh, visibility of posterior capsule behind the uh, opening of uh, uh, the disc you have in these cases. So I would say if you have a type 1, do hydro dissection, surgery will be safer and faster. And if you have type 2, type 3 or a type which is open, then you should avoid hydro dissection. Thank you for your kind listening. Uh, Rohit, again, thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, David, uh, one question from you. How do you approach these cases? And uh, do you do regularly the intraoperative OCT? And for those who really do not have intraoperative OCT, how do they go about with this? Yeah, that was a terrific presentation. Uh, perhaps like most of the attendees, we do not have uh, intraoperative OCT. So we have to assume that every case has, uh, let's say a type two or a type three. Uh, and I, uh, so I don't hydro dissect. What I have found helpful is to use the viscoelastic and to go subcapsular with whatever OVD you have in many different directions. And that loosens up the uh, subcapsular cortex and epinucleus uh, without the risk of the wave dissecting back to the posterior capsule. So that can be helpful when you have to remove the epinucleus and the cortex. The thing I try not to do is to not rotate the nucleus because I think that's the single most forceful maneuver we make is a rotation of the nucleus. And if you have a small opening, that's when it's likely to either tear or to extend. So with the horizontal chop, particularly with a softer nuclei that you frequently have or smaller endonuclei, you can chop them and get away without rotating uh, a lot the nucleus a lot of the time. So those would be my, my pearls for um, posterior polar. Uh, Richard, your take on this for that matter? I thought that was a lovely demonstration. I mean, uh, you can see the anatomy very clearly. The point is, is very good, is that most of us don't have a ASOCT. One of the things you need to remember about all of these cases, regardless of whether the posterior capsule is intact or not, is that the posterior capsule is almost always much thinner. And the liberty you might take when removing um, the epinucleus or, or cortex, just simply by touching the, uh, the posterior capsule with your aspirator will have no effect in a normal eye, but simply just touching it with your, uh, your eye equipment can be enough to, to break the posterior capsule. But I entirely agree with David. I take the view that they're all going to give you problems unless you do something about it. And I like um, the uh, Abe Vasavada technique, which I like to use, where you central trench, and then you do an inside out hydro delineation, which gives you the two halves of the nucleus that you can get out very easily. And then I would do the visco dissection after that to bring everything up towards me. And then I can aspirate it away from the, the posterior capsule. Uh, Dr. Manipal, sir, uh, at times, you know, I'm talking of you are totally into flax, but for the, for those majority of the people who do not have flax, for those with, uh, you know, uh, in RP center when you were there, they do multiple layer, layer by layer aspiration of the, you know, uh, rather than taking them out, the way you do it with the flax, they do it with the multiple layer separation. I think uh, that was layer by layer separation technique described by Professor Vajpay for posterior okay. polar cataract. Okay. Okay. Uh, Rohit, the uh, issues uh, have been highlighted excellently by uh, Professor Tatyal. Uh, the important thing here is that uh, even if you don't have a femto assisted uh, platform, and even if you don't have a microscope with an ASOCT, uh, we should never underestimate the power of a good slit lap examination and also the regular OCT that you have in your clinics. They can, as Dr. Tritial showed, they can also give you an idea, though the specificity and the sensitivity would not be that great, but they give us an idea. And at present, we are running a project uh, on this particular thing, the comparison between a pre-operative uh, OCT, a pre-operative -pre uh, IUL Master 700, as also an intra-operative OCT on the Femto. 
Now we have found that all cases when you are doing a femto laser, the OCT because it's a 360 degree and an excellent OCT, you can actually make out whether there is a pre-existing dehiscence or not. And that is going to guide me as to what I'm, as uh, Dr. Tetyal mentioned, we have already published it in Journal of Cataract and Refractive Surgery. So the OCT is really becoming a great tool, whether it is a pre-operative OCT and a slit lamp will also at times show you whether it's a typical onion whirl uh, kind of an appearance and whether there's a pre-existing defect or not. Now, important things, uh, which is just a uh, reiteration of what has happened, uh, what has been spoken of is that I do not rotate and I do not hydrodissect and I consider all my cases to be uh, having a pre-existing defect until, of course, I am doing a, a, a femto laser. If on a femto laser, I see that there is no pre-existing defect, then I am reasonably sure and I, I have never ever uh, been, uh, 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 it has never defaulted me uh, in my clinical judgment that whether this is going to have a problem or not. And I don't give a block in those cases where I know that there is no pre-existing defect. But otherwise, I will counsel the patient right from the beginning. I will be mentally prepared. I would normally do them under block and I would not hydrodissect and I would not rotate. I would do a multiple layer uh, hydro delineation and would try to break these uh, within uh, the uh, the pieces because normally they are softer cataracts and without rotation, I would wait, uh, like to take out all the nuclei and then attack the epinucleus and that also in situ uh, dissection would be better. So I think uh, the we have started to recognize posterior polar cataract and its management over the last decade, I would say. Earlier, uh, it was uh, really uh, when you would say I was in RP Center 1996, we never used to have actually considered to that extent as to what has to be done uh, in a polar cataract. But I think the OCT has become the guiding principle today for management of a posterior polar cataract. Thank you, sir. Now we move on to the next one. And the next one is going to be a talk by me. I would be speaking on... Uh, intraoperative floppy iris syndrome. And I have the proud privilege of speaking in uh, front of uh, Dr. David Chang. Who Dr. Rohit, if you'll allow me to introduce you for a moment. I know you will you know, try to bypass that. He's uh, one of, uh, again, a dear friend, one of the most modest and humble and uh, you know one of the most brilliant minds in uh, the North uh, of India and our international speaker. Uh, Dr. Rohit Prakash uh, has been a guide for a long, long time that I've been practicing, especially uh, learning a lot of FACO tips from him over the last 20 years. Uh, he's the organizer of the very popular winter uh, IRSI meeting uh, in Amritsar, which has become a landmark meeting in January, uh, attended by a lot of faculty and a lot of uh, other attendees. He's also been uh, the pioneer of several uh, you know, uh, techniques, new techniques, amongst them the flap motility sign, which went on to become one of the biggest award-winning uh, videos of all times and also the trip and blue staining technique and there are several which I could count but you know offhand uh, I will remember he's also you know developed a technique for uh, IL scaffold and the nuclear scaffold for uh, Morgarian cataract so uh, you know uh, Dr. Rohit thank you for organizing such informative, web informative webinars and uh, please uh, go ahead uh, with, with your presentation. Thank you Dr. Gaurav. So I would be talking on intraoperative floppy iris syndrome the long drawn battle. Well, patients using alpha-1 antagonist drugs have predisposition to IFIS and it doesn't spare any iris, but it is more prone in patients who have blue iris. In this study, as you will find, it is, more, it is there in Indian irises as well. So there's a triad in IFIS. There is iris billowing, followed by pupillary constriction, progressive, then iris incarcinating, prolapsing into the wound. So there are certain challenges which we have to bear in mind that there's a reduced maximum pupillary diameter. The change in iris structure is such that the dilator muscle region is thinned out and atrophic, subsequent to which whenever there's a fluid excess posterior to the iris, there is iris billowing because of the thin and atrophic iris, which can predispose to iris touch. So these patients, take a longer time to dilate and we have to give them the due of taking a longer time to dilate. The stable chamber settings are very mandatory because those will help reduce the fluid access to posterior iris surface. So this is something which we have to bear in mind 
that the chambers settings have to be stable so that there is a reduced excess of fluid to posterior iris surface. The fluidics which have to be used have to be used on the lower side so that there is less of turbulence in the anterior chamber, subsequent to which you know you have a fluent fluidics in the anterior chamber. We have to decrease the minimum iris to iris touch to minimum because there is an exaggerated response to iris touch. A small iris touch precipitates pupillary constriction because of the unopposed action of the constrictor because of the weak dilator muscle tone. So I'll be presenting a 74-year-old patient using tamsulosin for 14 years. He's a blue-eyed patient with maximum pupillary dilatation around 4.6 millimeter. The technique is that you go in for an anterior long tunnel because otherwise you can end up with a situation wherein with a short tunnel you are predisposed to an iris prolapse. A calibrated side port incision, a long tunnel incision is obligatory because at times with a non-calibrated, you can precipitate IFIS. Pharmacomidriasis with epinephrine is usually done, but it is relevant more in early stages where the receptors are blocked because in advanced stages, there is atrophy of the dilator muscle. So that doesn't affect more when the when it is a long standing case. In these cases, pupil expansion devices can be used. Viscomidriasis, in this case, I used a viscodispersive to dilate and flatten the uh, iris, the pupil. The ideal is the Arshinov Strysoft shell technique, viscodispersive, flattening over the iris, viscocohesive in the center, followed by a BSS solution. So, but we have to be mindful of the fact that if there is overinflation, we can end up with trauma to the oil iris. So that is another important thing. Capsular excess sizing is very important. You should not have a large rexus for that matter, because by any means, you do not want excess of fluid to the uh, mid periphery where the dilator muscle is there. So you make a slight, slightly smaller rexus. Hydrodissection should not be vigorous because that can also cause an iris prolapse. Continuous irrigation, definitely that has to be off. You can see how I put it off, on off. And while taking out the IA, it still has to be on an off situation. Because if you continue with continuous irrigation on, you will have a situation wherein there will be a high ACIOP which will cause iris prolapse. So that has to be kept in mind while doing this procedure. Next comes the nuclear emulsification. I would like you to focus on this side port incision. You will find that this being calibrated is not allowing large amount of fluid to efflux from the side port incision. So there is no billowing of iris in that region. The next thing which has to be borne in mind is that you have to leave the nuclear pieces in C2. Now, why do we have to leave the nuclear pieces in C2? Because we want to have the bag with the full volume so that the AC is stable and there's a less excess of fluid to posterior aspect of iris. This is another important thing which have, we have to bear in mind. In this, you will find that I'm using higher fluidics. I would suggest that normally you should not be but if by any means, if the caps, if the nucleus happens to be hard, there's a trick in doing it. You will see how I am, where I'm placing my phaco tip. It is in the proximal half of the pupil, which is farther away from the pupillary margin. So that will not attract the iris by any means. Irrigation, aspiration, by manual preferred, if you're using a, a coaxial, retract the iris, retract the sleeve more so that you have two planes. So you see how diligently I'm doing. See the vacuum, how I'm, how I'm manipulating the vacuum. When I'm behind the iris, the vacuum is low. The plane of irrigation is different. Low vacuum, hold it, bring it to the center and aspirate it. So that is the trick. Our prospective study was done on 105 cases. No patient was asked to stop the oral medication preoperatively. Intraoperatively, IFS was graded based on iris billowing 
pupil reconstriction and iris prolapse. And in our study, we realized that there was no IFIS in 38 patients and mild in 67, and there was a, no moderate or severe IFIS. So what was the added thing which we were doing? We were calibrating the side port incision. You will find that we were using a 500 micron outer diameter 25 gauge needle, which was calibrated in size and shape, wherein the distal end of the shaft of the chopper was 400 micron and the proximal was 450 to allow manipulation of the phaco chopper in this calibrated instrument. So this calibrated side port and scene is long tunnel. And you will find that it is mostly in 20 to 30%, it is self-sealing. In short, calibrating the side port incision helped in creating a stable chamber environment wherein we, were, we, we did not have access of fluid to the posterior aspect of the iris. So at the start of the surgery and at the end of the surgery, you will find that there is hardly any difference. So mark my words, trifles make perfection and perfection is no trifle. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thanks, Dr. Rohit, uh, for a wonderful presentation as usual. And uh, since we have the master of uh, IFS here, uh, you know, I'll seek uh, Dr. Chang's uh, comments on uh, some of the pearls, uh, you know, shared by uh, Dr. Rohit. Sure, uh, it was a lovely uh, review uh, and fantastic uh, animation showing the principles. Um, you know, my uh, one additional pearl would be that, I mean, that was a uh, beautiful surgery uh, for the, the rest of us, the rest of the audience. We all have to be honest and realize that with each subsequently smaller and smaller pupil diameter, you know, the, the risks do go up. And so, so you have to- One that, additional pearl that, would be that, I mean, that was a uh, beautiful surgery. Yeah. Uh, you have the, to evaluate the rest, us, the rest of the audience. We all have to be honest and realize that with a, each an subsequently echo. smaller and smaller pupil diameter, you know, the, the risks do go up. And so, so you have to... Excuse me for a moment. Uh, Dr. Rohit, can you admin, mute your... Uh, there's some disturbance uh, coming. Uh, admin, can you see why there is an echo? ...and realize there is an echo. ...smaller and smaller pupil diameter. Sunil, can you see why there's an echo coming? From Dr. Rohit's, uh, uh, I think, you know, there's something playing in Dr. Rohit. Yeah. Uh, there's some discussion. Okay. Um, sorry about that. So um, if there is a, a, a denser lens and so forth, I, you know, you, you have to make that decision, uh, just like with a hydrodissection or not, early on, do I put in a pupil expansion device? Uh, and I think um, more often than not, there are times when I wish I did. I still like uh, iris retractors. Uh, and one of the nice things about them is if you put them in a diamond configuration with a sub-incisional retractor, realize that you are pulling the iris down and behind the incision. So it's really impossible to get iris prolapse uh, then. And the one nice thing about the IFIS pupil is that it's not fibrotic, so you can stretch it quite a lot and it will come back down uh, uh, without trauma. And uh, that's uh, probably for me, the one pearl is remember that sub-incision iris retractor preventing iris prolapse. Uh, thanks, David. Those were uh, wonderful tips. And uh, you know, at this point, I'll take a couple of other panelists uh, into the discussion. I see Dr. Partha Biswas. Why, who why, why there's, an, uh, there's an echo. Remember that sub-incision iris retractor preventing iris prolapse. Yeah, no, it's perfectly. Uh, yes, it's is there an echo still? Okay, so <clears throat> I think there's something with the system. Maybe you know something is causing. I, I, I'll request a Partha to you know add in. I've seen you do uh, you know IFS patients as well quite often. So yeah, thank you very much, uh, Gaurav, and thanks to the whole team. Uh, the IFS is uh, something that you know each case is a typical case in its own self. So the moment that the pupil is gradually getting constricted and IFS is setting in is the time when the surgeon must assess the capability and the use of the devices as and when required. So it's always better not to injure the iris, which is crowding in, and to immediately use viscoelastics 
as well as the devices like the iris hooks or the uh, device like the b-hex ring or the malleagon ring so the comfort of removing the pieces and especially if it is a large thick cataract is very important the other thing also if it's a very soft cataract which does not chop well is again a difficulty when the iris is crowding in so you have a large bowl of uh, uh, soft material, soft nucleus, which is sitting right tight and the pupil is constricting. So this is again a, a, an important uh, situation where the iris needs to be taken out and uh, by the devices and the bowl can be removed very well. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Partha, for those nice tips. And uh, I think uh, we've learned a lot. Well, Gaurav, Gaurav, yeah. well, um, you know, Richard Packard uh, is actually the first to describe the use of uh, phenylephrine. So maybe uh, that's okay, one should, thing we, we have that. We have a presentation it. coming up on uh, intracameral uh, mitriatics, and uh, you know, uh, I think uh, we can take uh, Richard on uh, right after that. I'm, I'll be presenting on intracameral mitriatics, so maybe you know we'll take Richard right after that. And uh, uh, at this point, I think uh, I'll invite uh, Dr. Rohit Omprakash to uh, please invite our next speaker, so that we are running a little bit behind schedule. Uh, I think I don't see uh, Dr. Rohit Om Prakash. So I think uh, there was some problem with this thing. Uh, our next speaker is going to be uh, Dr. Uh, Rohit Shetty. Now, again, a dear friend and a brilliant mind. Uh, he's a researcher. And uh, let me quickly share uh, a small slide, which uh, Rohit, uh, I have a small intro slide for you. If you'll just uh, let me do that. And uh, uh, OK, here goes. A dear friend so, and a brilliant uh, mind. Uh, he's a researcher. and. Uh, let me so there is some echo coming in. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Uh, Rohit Omprakash, uh, would you like to introduce uh, Dr. Rohit Shetty because you're back? We missed you for a moment. Uh, Dr. Rohit Omprakash, sir, can you hear me? Uh, okay, let me go ahead. Let me go ahead. Yeah, let me go ahead. So, uh, Dr. Rohit Shetty is uh, a brilliant scientist. Uh, he's a refractive, uh, cornea and refractive surgeon. He's vice chairman of the Narayan Nitrale in uh, Bangalore. Everybody knows about it internationally. He is the chief mentor at uh, Dual Mentor Program, and he has done path-breaking work on biomechanics and uh, stromal molecular markers in refractive surgery. He has been a pioneer on uh, tear film assays, and he is doing uh, you know path-breaking work and uh, trains uh, ex amazing fellows. He has received the Case Beer Award in 2019 in the. ISRS. Actually, there is a lot to tell about Rohit, uh, but I'll just say that he's uh, really been, uh, you know, a big uh, leader in Indian ophthalmology who has uh, inspired so many uh, youngsters and uh, seniors alike. So, uh, Rohit, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you, sir. Can you see my slides? Yes, yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, thanks for this kind invite. Uh, uh, Namrata ma'am, Maipal sir, and uh, Martha sir, the entire ARS team for uh, this opportunity. My talk is something to do more with optics than with uh, any surgical procedures. I know financial interest uh, in what I'm speaking here. Uh, when I started off uh, many years back, what really, what I liked about the whole art of uh, procedures is that you could mix uh, your science and you would convert it into your art, which is your surgical skill. And that's where your wonder lies, you know, if you merge both of them together. Because many times uh, we, are, uh, we are always more on our surgical team procedures, we miss the whole mathematics and science behind it. So this was um, maybe uh, 13 or 14 years back, I decided to build a small optics lab uh, which we call it as novel, and uh, it was called the quest for understanding vision. At that point of time, the first tool uh, which I incorporated into my technology was the uh, the OPD3 scanner, which I'm going to speak today from NIDAC. Again, no financial interest at this point of time. Uh, <clears throat> it has a lot of application, but I'm just looking at from the cataract surgery point of view. For the customization of cataract surgery today, we need to be proper with the spear, cylinders, spherical aberration, and how you take care of your near uh, additions. I just stick to opticals, optics, which is the area of interest. 
all this are very important for a cataract surgeon today. Irrespective of your skill or technology, it starts with your tear, how does the epithelium change, the stroma, the internal optics, and you have to look beyond into your retina also. So you have a map like this, which comes out from your, uh, from your OPD3 scanner, and it has your aberrations, you have a refractive errors, spherical aberrations. It's, it looks busy, pupil informations. But what is interesting is it gives you even the contrast at uh, different uh, pupil sizes. At one shot, you know what is happening to the optical picture of your eye, which is very important because Otherwise, most of the time to get this much, it would take a long time and it just takes around eight to 10 seconds for the image to capture. Let me start with the tear film. A 43 year old man coming to you for a cataract surgery and his placido disc is like this. And all he has is a terribly bad uh, corneal surface. And the machine says that your patient has keratoconus, be, be aware of it. You treat him, this patient we treated with the lippy flow and we did redid his assessment, the whole cornea became more regular and it became, it says that it's normal. So what happens is your curvature maps, which you take from your uh, IOL master or a lens star is dependent on your tear first, uh, dependent on how it works. And this is very important that you're, and this gives you an assessment of when you treat it, how does your tear film behave? And you can see that the whole corneal aberration completely changes uh, from, uh, from a, poor tear film to, an, to a normal tear film. And all these things can make a huge impact on your planning. So how does it help a cataract surgeons? Of course, planning different lenses. Um, this concept is I'm going to go a little later into my presentation. When you make a, when you put an IOLs, you look at many things. Your spherical errors, you look at your uh, astigmatism, and you look at what is important today with all your new lenses coming out with the extended depth of focus lenses, you look at how your cornea behaves to spherical aberrations. So can you incorporate everything in this technology? Before we go there, we need to know where do you implant your lenses? Because over time, I think we're going to be heavily dependent on the placing your lenses to the right place. You have a mesopic pupil, the photopic pupil, and the difference between them. See, all this uh, are very important for your planning. Of course, the angle kappa comes immediately. So there's some slight issues, but anyway, this is the difference between the photopic and the mesopic. And OPD3 scanner gives you all this difference, the mesopic angle kappa, photopic angle kappa. This is very important because you are not only looking at one size of the pupil, the pupil can change. And the alpha distance, angle alpha distance, this is very important, the angular distance between visual axis and the center of the limbus. So all this comes at one go and you are able to check before you do a surgery at everything related to the axis of the eye, which is very, very important in today's practice. And there are different uh, normative data based on this. And uh, if you are not aligned properly, then you have issue of uh, glare, halos, photo this photopsias and many other things. And uh, this is what happens when you're perfectly centered and this is your multifocal and you see the reflection which is not perfectly centered, it ends up in a poor quality of vision. Now, for the premium lenses, what do we have? It gives you photopic, mesopic, distance, and uh, the pupil size for this range, higher order aberrations, everything what a cataract surgeon needs at one go. I mean, of course, this again can be used for a refractive surgery also. And uh, it also takes up keratoconus suspects. There are a lot of keratoconus patients come to you who never known that they have a keratoconus. And you can think about planning in aspheric lenses. And uh, this is a form, I mean, all of us know what type of aspericity we need to correct if the cornea has a certain level of asp aspherical aberration. So your customization becomes easier. Based on your corneal aspericity and spherical aberration, you can choose the type of lenses you want. If you want to, or you are trying to look at one of your extended depth focus lenses. The cornea is very mysterious and that's where it's very important because many times, like I said, is my patient suitable for multifocal? You can see that the corneal aberrations is really high here. And at one go, you know that he's not suitable for multifocal because internal aberrations are because of cataract. And in this patient, the corneal aberration is normal. It's only the internal. So even though cornea looks a little irregular, you are suitable for a multifocal lenses. 
and this year everything is both are normal so you can choose based on what you want so virtually it gives you one set of printout which tells you what to do and this is a patient who had a lasik 10 years ago and he wants a perfect vision now very poor corneal uh, uh, irregularity you can see that aberrations are very high so what do we do in these patients again this can be this is a very useful tool because in these patients do anything on the lenses you're going to have a lot of trouble so what we do in these patients is we regularize the cornea with laser and then do the cataract surgery so this is a simple example the cornea is you can see the aberrations are very high we did the laser on them just correct the irregularity the corneal aberrations are reduced by half so the cornea you you have enlarged the zone and now you can do a you can see that the perfect cataract surgery and ends up with a very very perfect vision and this is uh, what happens when you when you do this kind of procedure so it helps us to understand all this so customized cataract surgery this is just a quick same slide so i'll just skip this once uh, aging lenses this i described uh, 10 years back that was a time the word dysfunctional lens syndrome was not there uh, the lens aberration increases over time and uh, we are all used to this locks classification but uh, we had to things have changed today this is a patient of mine who who had the lasik surgery done many years back comes back with blurring of vision and what i see is the cornea is perfect is the internally he has got a lot of aberrations and at that point of time i called it as a zernike cataract today it's called as uh, dysfunctional lens syndrome and we waited i can see that actually over time she developed a cataract and uh, we planned a cataract surgery for her and perfectly all right so basically uh, it helps to link to your biometry uh, it helps to get a very perfect uh, uh, you know biometry in terms of optics perfect outcomes it can predict and most important i can I, what i can say is it helps to customize your uh, lenses thank you uh, thanks uh, rohit uh, i'll see if dr rohit om prakash is uh, back with us i do so see him there thanks for a wonderful talk actually um, you know as dr chang was mentioning that we are moving on to a lot to refractive cataract surgery i find that the devices like the opd scan have really changed uh, the way we look at you know we can beyond biometry as i would like to say a lot of uh, you know and uh, i would like to ask uh, dr bharti who's one of our panelists and has a lot of experience with the opd scan on uh, how he uh, finds that you know devices like the opd scan add to you know uh, our uh, quality of the cataract surgery can you unmute yourself sir dr bharti you have to unmute yourself yeah thanks Yeah. First of all, uh, wonderful talk by Rohit Shetty on uh, use of uh, OPD scan uh, and also the AL scan. Uh, what what I'm using from NIDAC, and that is uh, partly a wonderful tool to get the post-op, post-LASIK uh, result for IOL power calculation. And all these facts, besides all these facts, what he has uh, said. one small clinical observation which i wanted to share was that if you implant the multifocal eye when i am talking about the premium eye wells when you talk when you implant the multifocal eye well if you orient it on a vertical axis the centration of the uh, the eye well is much better uh, as compared to when you are implanting it on a in a horizontal plane so that's another factor i have uh, observed that uh, this uh, uh, vertical orientation of the implantation of multifocal eye well is uh, is always gives you a, a very central central uh, you know ring in the in front of the pupil and uh, that's a factor of course uh, the corneal aberrations and the dryness and the mgd <coughs> these are very important factor they have to be assessed properly and um, opd scan the wonderful thing about the opd scan is that it gives you aberrations corneal aberrations separately as compared to the internal aberrations and the lenticular aberrations and those uh, factors have to be taken into account when you are uh, doing the you know aberrations which can cause issues with the visual performance after the cataract surgery so these uh, couple of things are very important thank you thanks dr bharti i think in fact it's become invaluable uh, 
Am I, am I audible? Okay. I wanted to take Dr. Richard Packard uh, on uh, this and uh, you know ask him about uh, how, how he feels that devices like the OPD scan and similar devices which combine abrometry and topography and help us and whether angle angle alpha, if you had a patient with significant angle alpha, would you not do a multifocal surgery? Like what's your threshold for not choosing a multifocal aisle if uh, angle, kappa is, angle alpha is significant? I think these devices have, have given us a whole new uh, approach for using multifocal lenses. I think we didn't realize in the past quite how important these, these issues are. And certainly the, the matter of tear film is one that very many people don't take into proper consideration. I'm astonished at how many people don't actually look at the topography before they're putting in uh, lenses. They simply look at the printout from the, the IOL master or, or, or similar. And unless you actually look for it, you won't know it's there. Uh, I mean, Doug Koch has talked about this very frequently. He actually uh, doses all his patients before they have any measurements done with lubricants, simply to try and uh, get a, a better impression as to what the, the measurements are. Because unless you get the, the measurements right, and if the tear film is, is so important when, when you're using these devices, you're never going to get the results that, that you want. But angle, also, uh, angle uh, kappa, I mean, this, these are important. We know that angle kappa is, is something that you need to be very much aware of with hyperopic patients. We've seen from uh, Dr. Rowett's uh, uh, presentation how just going a little bit off with alpha will mean that the, the rings of the multifocal are not where you want them to be. That, therefore, the quality of vision that you're going to achieve is not going to be what you want. And given that this is a refractor procedure, that the patients are very demanding, everything that you can do that will improve your chances of getting the outcome that they want and you want has got to be a good thing. Uh, thanks, Richard. Uh, Rohit, uh, at your place, uh, you do a lot of, uh, you know, you use multiple devices. And uh, what, what's your threshold for not choosing a multifocal IOL? Uh, do, you, do you use it as a criteria, like the angle alpha or the angle? Well, alpha? I think yeah. you also want to look at the different multifocal lenses because the thresholds are different for different lenses. A trifocal lens is the least forgiving. But a, a number of the EDOF lenses, w w you can get away with it. They're, they're not quite so uh, uh, important to be absolutely centered, and you'll still get a perfectly decent result. So I don't think you can generalize on this. Sure. Rohit, would you like to put in a final? Uh, uh, yeah. One thing I wanted to add to this uh, optics, uh, the whole dimension of optics is, Optics have agreed that it has, there is, uh, I mean, we are known about cutoffs and other things, but we did a study, which is just not published yet. We looked at uh, a set of patients where the angle alpha was more than 0.9, which is way, way off. And still in the past, we had done a multifocal. And there were a set of patients where the angle alphas, kappas were all well within the normal limits, and they were perfectly happy. So what we found was, the patients were, who had many of them who had a very bad angle alpha, but still you put a multifocals were very happy compared to the ones who were unhappy, who had a perfect angles. So what I believe is optics is a physical mathematical dimension. There are various mechanisms in our optical system which can dampen your suppress what you sometimes see. And for me, what is most important apart from this angle alpha kappa is the ability of your eyes to actually fuse. To be very frank, many of our patients at the age of 55, 60 have stopped. The virgins is very, very poor. The ability to fuse is very poor. They suffer from many, many issues of especially related to convergence. They maybe have a lot of, many of them have a convergence excess or a convergence insufficiency. So just an angle alpha may not have, or angle al kappa may not have an implication if you don't do a good orthoptics evaluation to figure out if they have been suffering from any of the convergence issues. So you may have a very normal alpha or kappa angle. You may have a central, very perfectly centralized multifocal. The patient may have all the complaints of glare halos. And if you send them for your good orthoptics evaluation, you'll find that they would be suffering from a, a, a fusional virgins deficiencies or a convergence issue. So, what is important in our practice is more than the uh, more than the uh, alpha or kappa angle. We also look at whether they have something. To, how is their convergence? Because a, a, a well done multifocal with a poor convergence has more. Uh, it plays the more devil than uh, having a, a abnormal angle. So that is something which we need to keep in mind. Thanks, Rohit. I think that those are amazing tips and uh, 
I see Arun raising his hand, but uh, okay, Arun, a quick one because we have two questions coming from the previous uh, lecture which I'm going to ask right now. But yes, you can chip in with a quick one, Arun. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, we can talk during my own conversation. No, that's uh, okay. You you can uh, go ahead. Yeah. Very important, Rohit. I love the fact that you went to optics. In fact, for 30 years, this is what I've been slamming eye surgeons with. We cannot have parameters. Each patient is unique. I've been involved with the OPD for over two and a half decades with all their assistants. They are collecting our data now for retrospect analysis. And they also have a special formula available aware, uh, elsewhere. It's a software called IOL Station, if you've looked at that. It's not available in the US. Very, very important point really to stress, Tom. There are no such thing as parameters. In fact, 78% of my practice is fixing complications of premium lenses. Surgery is very well done. That's my talk. So I love the fact that you touched on that point and going towards optics. Very, very important. So please proceed. We'll talk in my talk later. Uh, th thanks, Arun. Uh, th that was nice. I have a question for Dr. Tithyal and then one for Dr. Chang. There are questions from uh, the audience uh, who are all logged in from all over the world. We have lots of questions. Uh, Dr. Alejandro Tello from Colombia uh, wants to know that if there is a pre-existing posterior capsular rupture already visible in the pre-op examination in a posterior polar cataract uh, with cataract particles in the anterior vitreous, uh, what would be your plan of action? Would you go for a vitrectomy first or would you plan your surgery differently? Uh, Dr. Tithyal, sir. It's a uh, very good question. Uh, once we have a patient who has a pre-existing uh, defect, in such cases, you have to assess how big is the defect and how is your nucleus hardness in such cases and accordingly design your surgery accordingly. Best would be uh, the technique we have described is layer by layer fake in such cases. So you uh, do a you know, central uh, sculpting, take out the layer by layer and leave the you know, posterior plate till the end. And, and uh, take out that plate to us end, and that might uh, leave a you know, uh, small uh, opening which is there. Mostly these cases are congenital, and sometimes they do have a fibrosis of an opening also. And they uh, normally don't, don't enlarge uh, during your procedure. The only thing is in those cases is to not to uh, drop the things behind. If that happens, then you have to do a pass for an vitrectomy. As far as I'm concerned, I may, may not just start with the pass plan in these cases. I'll do a routine entry segment surgery and see how a patient does. Uh, thanks, Dr. Tithyal. And then I have a quick question for Dr. David before we go on to the next lecture. And uh, there is Dr. V.V. Raman from Chennai who addresses this question to Dr. Chang. At what stage does he do OVD cleavage between capsule and cortex? Okay. Uh, yes. I uh, For um, uh, the posterior polar what you want to do is, as soon as you do the CCC, you actually want the chamber to uh, shallow a little bit, and then you can inject the viscoelastic cannula, and you can kind of come through different side ports in the incision to go into different quadrants. But you must soften the chamber first by either burping out some of the viscoelastic that's there so you don't overfill. Perfect. Thanks, uh, Dr. Chang. And I'll pass on uh, to Dr. Rohit Om Prakash uh, to take over from here. I think we have him back, sir. Uh, thank you. I'm sorry that you had to uh, you know, exit and join back again. There were two devices. I was not aware the second and why it was working. So now we move on to none other than Gaurav Lutra, who would be talking on non-device uh, small pupil FACO. And he would be talking about his IOL preferences in 2020. Over okay. to Thank, thanks a lot, sir. And uh, I'll just uh, share my screen uh, in a moment. So, in fact, uh, I was going to be speaking on only the my IOL preferences, and then Dr. Rohit said that this is a surgical strike, so we want you to be speaking on something besides your IOL preferences. So, uh, I wanted to share uh, some tips on, uh, as I said before on my experiences with topical versus intraoperative uh, mitriasis with intracambral drugs, and uh, I have no financial interest. Uh, so mitriasis, we all know, is a prerequisite for safe cataract surgery. And uh, you know most surgeons uh, require a stable, good, adequate pupil dilation. And intraoperative meiosis uh, can cause complications of all kinds. Uh, we all know that. I don't have to go into the details. Uh, intraoperative meiosis and sequelae can further jeopardize the final outcomes, and we are all looking at 6 6 outcomes now. So, we pupil mitriasis becomes an absolute must uh, and an adequate one and a stable one at that. So, 
uh, it's probably the most important factor we all are looking for uh, right from the time we start doing our residency that is the pupil well dilated and you know it's like a fixation for all of us it facilitates all our surgical maneuvers especially when we are using toric iols we would uh, definitely want an adequate mitrasis as well and uh, definitely goes in improving the quality of cataract surgery and in one survey which uh, i came up on uh, the european observatory indicated that stable mitrasis was more important surgeons than the largest size of dilation to begin with at the surgery so we've been all using and uh, mitratic drops of all kinds and we've come a long way uh, the only things that uh, probably you know stand out as being uh, you know difficult with uh, topical mitrasis is gradual onset of mitrasis could take anywhere from 15 20 minutes to an hour or even more for for those difficult cases limited bioavailability and then of course you have to use multiple drops uh, which can uh, possibly damage the ocular surface uh, sometimes you may have inconsistent mitrasis and intraoperative pupil meiosis in challenging cases and uh, systemic absorption and allergies so we now have uh, good options available internationally they've been available for long and now in india we also have another option available uh, which uh, can be used and uh, can be used as an adjunct or it can be used even alone uh, for prompt onset of pupil dilation or stable mitrasis also combined with lignocaine injection so better anesthesia can be supplemented at any time of course we've had access to epinephrine and adrenaline for long but we've all been hesitant to use it on a regular basis for fear of uh, endothelial damage and of course Uh, there is less risk of systemic exposure several studies are there let me come to uh, you know some couple of unique cases that i wanted to share with you this was a lady who uh, you know had to be postponed three times because uh, she would every time uh, for almost all drops including our topical antibiotics and our uh, you know topical mitratrics of all kind she would get an allergy so we had to go ahead with the surgery where nothing was used for the previous few days and uh, we uh, this is this was a learning uh, case for me about couple of years back and uh we had this patient uh, we decided to use only intracameral uh, uh, phenocaine which is which was under trials with me at that time it's basically a combination of uh, phenylephrine topicamide and uh, lidocaine and you can see that uh, you know it gives you fairly rapid onset of uh, mitrasis so it gives you a fairly stable mitrasis of course you can see that the pupil size is not that great but this patient's pupil size the biggest pupil dilation preoperatively examined was also just about 5.5 to 6 mm so uh, this was the best mitrasis we could have hoped for and uh, it allowed me to complete the surgery and uh, we uh, you know it mitrasis remained right till the end i did not have to supplement it so this was a learning uh, case for me almost 3 4 years back and of course we do have access to all kinds of devices so uh, you know this was another challenging case where i felt that uh, you know intracameral day for us this was a hard brown uh, cataract with uh, you know uh, mitrasis which was only uh, preoperative mitrasis was not adequate and uh, we were anticipating uh, problems in this patient we stained and as soon as we uh, washed out the trypan blue we realized that the pupil had come down and i love to do visco mitrasis in fact i don't jump to dive devices right in the beginning in fact uh, 90 95% of my cases i can usually manage uh, just without uh, use of uh, any of this uh, you know pupil expansion devices because if you have a 4 mm Uh, or slightly bigger pupil you can usually uh, get away unless you have a case like this where it's uh, really hard so at this point we decided to use uh, uh, intracameral uh, phenocaine and uh, we thought that this might help us this patient also had a floppy iris it was a supra hard cataract as you can see uh, this is a fast forwarded video because it actually went on for much longer than what you'll see here and uh, i was able to crack uh, the nucleus and uh, do lateral separation but by the time we finished cracking uh, the nucleus completely the pupil had started coming down enough that i was challenged and uh, i used intracameral uh, phenocaine at this time because i was not able to appreciate the rex's edge and my maneuvers were becoming more and more dangerous so one option would have been to switch to devices i could have gone on i i don't like using any of the rings at this point because once your rexus is there and you can't see the rexus edge very clearly i would have preferred to use iris hooks so i was already preparing to get the iris hooks and then uh, thought that if i'll just use uh, phenocaine here it might just uh, help me and uh, we did manage to complete the case so it it sometimes works in fact most of the times it does work and you can see here that i was able to uh, complete the case and uh, you know my dresses remained in fact uh, right till the end more than what we anticipated and i was able to do a profitable iol injection there was uh, another case where a patient had been referred uh, 
following a cataract surgery which was aborted as well and uh, we had a there was a patient doc surgeon who had a pc rent and uh, had referred with a vitreous loss did not have uh, a working vitrectomy set up there so we went in with the also patient had a small pupil so we did a vitrectomy and by the time we managed to get the cortex out uh, from the uh, from the bag uh, the pupil started coming down and at this point i had to put in a three piece lens into the sulcus but you can see that the pupil has become really small and uh, i am not able to visualize the rexus so we started off with a much better sized pupil and i was struggling to get this uh, using a bimanual approach trying to get that haptic in but the tone of the pupil was enough that it would not allow the haptic to stay there so i struggled two three times but it would not go at this point i decided to use uh, intracameral mitriasis and uh, was able to you know we were able to get a quick dilation within few seconds enough that i now had uh, more ability to uh, let the lens in and uh, i was able to finally manage and get the haptic in and we were able to save the day and uh, we it went off well i'll show a last patient here where again uh, we it saved the day for us femto is known to cause sometimes intraoperative mitriasis and myosis and especially if you are lining up three four cases together usually the last one will have uh, you know a, a myosis like this sometimes and uh, here we realized right from the beginning that this pupil was not going to be adequate i put in phenocane and you can see that now we have a very adequate pupil just see how i started off with it was pretty bad and uh, with phenocane i was able to get uh, you know i was again preparing my devices so what i really wanted to say was that uh, th this is a good option before jumping on to any of your uh, devices this can really save the day for me it has worked quite well and i rarely use devices now uh, of course there are those patients where it won't work and uh, i'll pipe up pipe us this so quickly coming on to four slides to show what my al preferences are which i was meant to speak on but uh, dr rohit suggested i speak on a surgical topic so uh, for monofocal ials i would like to use a hydrophobic lens with a square edge uh, reliable injector system preloaded if possible and i like to do hydro implantation so that's my preferred technique wanted to share this small video clip of 10 seconds this is the lens which i currently prefer to use i think uh, you saw this right in the beginning of the presentation it's a beautiful lens it's a preloaded lens from nidec i do hydro implantation so i like to use a shooter and uh, we all know that preloaded uh, lenses is the way to go almost all companies are now moving to preloaded now the advantage i find with this uh, injector system is that you know it, even with a wound assisted injection uh, it uh, with a 2.2 incision i don't have to you can see that the cartridge tip can actually go well inside so you know you don't have to do a wound assisted all the time and it's a very predictable injector it has a small groove at the bottom which allows delivery of the haptic in a very perfect way and uh, so it comes out very beautifully and there is no rotation so this would be my choice for a monofocal preloaded for uh, monofocal extended depth uh, we have good options uh, available now i will not go into the details but i like to use wherever patient wants a near ability but does not want any of thing th things which go with a multifocal lens i would go for a edof lens toric ials i don't have to speak because i think 35% of our practice all of us uh, surgeons who are doing torics uh, would be happy to use torics there is no question mark on that and my last slide uh, on multifocal ials i think we've moved on completely from bifocal ials to the trifocal ials which seem to have uh, you know great ability now and we have several available so there are three four of them and i try to choose them between them you know for depending on what kind of ability that the patient wants and uh, definitely torics with my threshold to switch to toric my trifocal is very low and uh, i think with that i will stop i'm sorry for having exceeded the time by one minute or one and a half minutes thank, thank you sir you. i'll just stop sharing the screen yeah i think uh, gorov that was a great presentation and you are a great surgeon so with from for all the small pupils you got away but i just want to know that i mean why in some of the cases i mean i thought at least two or three cases you could have put nylon hooks at you know any point in time and uh, shorten the duration of the surgery so why do you think you wouldn't want to put it uh, you know what is preventing you from putting it no that's that namrata you're right in fact you know there will be those instances of course i did not show those instances here where you know where we have a really small pupil where i will go with the device right from the beginning you know invariably what happens is when you start off sometimes you notice that you have a pupil which is you know with viscomitriasis is going to about 5 mm and you expect to complete the case uh, you know uh, comfortably if you are going to do a short surgery but 
uh, as luck would have it, sometimes you will have patients where the pupil will come down. So it's intraoperative meiosis really where, uh, you know, you have to think whether you would like to use a device or not. And, you know, putting a device would actually also uh, prolong the surgery. So I would always try to use uh, intracameral mitriatic at that point. And most of the times, you know, I will not use a device at all. And if intracameral mitriatic does not work, which happens in one or two out of 10 patients, I would obviously switch to a device. But if there was a bad pupil, I would start with a device for sure. Uh, that's probably what you wanted to say. Yeah. So, Dr. David Chang, there's a question for you. Which uh, pupil expansion device will you uh, will you use if you have to for floppy iris? And then I think you can take a question for Richard, Dr. Richard Packard about intracameral phenocaine. All right. Yeah, I think uh, any of the pupil expansion devices uh, work well in the U.S. Of course, the Malugan ring is uh, very popular. I know the Bhattacharji uh, hex ring uh, is available uh, to you. That's a nice device. Uh, and I think the key is you have to, uh, as uh, Gaurav said, it's very tough to do this when you've got the CCC because typically one of those edges is going to hook the CCC and you can tear it or it will decenter the pupil. So it's a decision to make uh, early on. I just want to add that was a very uh, important uh, presentation about intracameral, you know, epinephrine, phenylephrine. The other time to use it, remember, is if you're starting to get iris prolapse. And a lot of times we just sort of see that little hint of the iris jumping up to the incision. It's not quite prolapse. That's when you should put in the uh, alpha agonist because that'll sometimes stretch the pupil. Once the uh, iris already comes out of the, the incision and it gets uh, uh, depigmented, it's very tough. As you know, it's shredded at that point. So anticipate that use the alpha agonist then, uh, and if not, if that still doesn't work, then a sub-incisional iris retractor. Quick uh, uh, small response from my side, Gaurav. Uh, I think, Gaurav, uh, the title of your talk should be Small Pupils for Strong Surgeons. And you have to design a talk, Small Pupils for Small Surgeons as well. So coming to that uh, next part, the small pupil for small surgeons, I think all of us can be small or can be strong. But what is very important is to apply the devices where you are going uncomfortable. So that I think holds true from all of us. And uh, the other part is if the rexis is visible, then you can get along with a good nucleotomy. You can get along with the uh, hydro dissection and everything. But if the rexis is not visible and you have to lift the iris to see the edge of the rexis, then is the time that the skill of the surgeon is so very important. If you have to do it where, where you demonstrated so very well the excellent way of uh, doing a small pupil without the devices. So... But in any case, if at any point of time one needs a device, I think it should be put in. It makes the surgery uh, a lot easier and uh, the nucleotomy as well as the cortical matter cleanup, everything, plus the intraocular lens going in the bag itself is uh, very important. Thank yeah. you. Dr. Packard, your uh, take on uh, intracameral adrenaline, please. Yeah, well, I, uh, David uh, alluded, I've been using intracameral midriatics for a very long time long before there were a, any um, products that were out there that you could buy off the shelf. And I would normally start with 1% um, lidocaine intracamerally. And the reason I would do this before I use the alpha agonist, and I normally use phenylephrine, is because when you inject the phenylephrine into the eye, patient under topical anesthesia will feel discomfort. So you get a start of the dilatation with the, the, the lidocaine, then you get the full dilatation with the, the phenylephrine. But I think the important thing here with all of this, with the small pupils, is to have a very, very low threshold for intervention. If the thought even remotely crosses your mind that you might need something, then for goodness sake, use it. Because if you don't at that point, you will have gone to another stage and will make life more difficult. Now, if you have done the capsular rexis, putting in hooks isn't so much of an issue. All you need to do is put a bit, a bit of a viscoelastic underneath the iris to lift it up. You can actually hook up the uh, the iris very easily. And I would recommend using hooks in that situation rather than the rings, which can become more complicated. You know, the great thing, as David says about the hooks, is it gives you all sorts of options. And the other thing you want to remember also with the intracameral um, uh, pharmacy is that patients with pseudoexfoliation do not respond to phenylephrine. It's one of the few instances where when you put this in, it has absolutely no effect. When you see that, you probably know the patient's got pseudoexfoliation anyway, then that's the time to put in your, your uh, device.
ಪ್ರಾಬ್ಲಮ್ and i will fully agree that in case you are anticipating a problem it is better to do the thing uh, to put any uh, devices earlier than later once you are in a problem and the third thing that i'll wish to say is in the opd we did a study uh, there was a thesis uh, by dr vinay gorodia and uh, dr ghosh and i self uh, i was the co guide uh, there is a strong potentiating effect of topical xylocaine Uh, so instead of pouring lots and lots of uh, uh, the midiatric drops uh, in the opd if you put a drop of any anesthetic it loosens the epithelial junction and it, it increases the bioavailability of the midiatric drop in the interior interior chamber so there is a significant and this has been published uh, by others also that there is a significant potentiating effect of topical xylocaine or topical paracaine if you want uh and then put the drops 5 minutes later and you should always try it for 3 4 times and not more than that the dilated drops because otherwise if they are not to act they will not act uh, but just uh, adding a drop uh, two drops of this uh, uh, xylocaine is good and as professor daljit singh had pointed out especially in children uh, we prefer to give uh, xylocaine plus epinev <coughs> plus epinephrine plus epitrate as a small subconjunctival injection at all the four four uh, 3 o'clock quadrant that means at 12 9 6 and 3 uh, very very small doses uh, as a subconjunctival injection at the limbus for dilating in pediatric cataracts uh, if you uh, uh, really are having an inadequate dilatation so these are a couple of other tricks that uh, apart from uh, what you spoke uh, that i will use for trying to dilate a pupil which is uh, giving us problems thanks dr mipal in fact uh, i think your point is very well taken because even for intracameral i feel that the combination of lidocaine with the alpha agonists you know it really makes a difference because you know you have more sustained and you know as dr richard also mentioned that you know, he would initially put lidocaine and then uh, use the uh, you know intracameral uh, this thing I, i for me also i think it really works much better because of the combination that we are using now and it's available in many names now but there was a quick question before we go on on ometria which um, dr mipal likes to talk about uh you wanted to uh, is that uh, in fact let's ask dr david uh, what is your preferred intracameral mitriatic and uh, would you use something different and uh, ometria is available in the us but not to us in india right well um i use a compounded uh, phenylephrine we don't have a commercial intracameral phenylephrine uh but you uh, also many people will use uh, epinephrine uh okay. with uh, if you just use the um the epinephrine you have to dilute it because the ph is very low so you can dilute it 1 to 4 uh, or 1 to 5 you know amidria is uh, complicated because uh it does have ketorolac and phenylephrine but the, the laws in the US in terms of how they get reimbursement require them to charge a lot of money for that and so uh we actually uh, i think it has uh, the majority of surgeons actually will just use phenylephrine or epinephrine epinephrine costs $4 you do have to dilute it and you can add it to the bottle uh it's uh, unfortunate that it has to do with our sort of FDA that the product omidria is just extremely expensive uh, thanks david i think uh, we'll go on we are a little behind schedule and uh, i will in one yes that yes so i have omidria you don't have ketorolac for intracameral i think it is mandatory for all of us to use uh any nsa uh, prior to the starting of the surgery because that maintenance of the pupillary dilatation is significantly uh enhanced by any sort of uh, nsa that's there and uh, ketorolac is one of them that you can so you can use them as topical drops prior to starting the surgery especially Absolutely. especially for uh, femtocataract surgeries because the pupil yeah. will eventually come down so we have dr rohit om prakash back with us uh, some uh, hassles with the internet uh, i'll request sir to invite our next speaker dr kamal kapoor please Dr Kamal uh, he is the most enthusiastic person you will ever come across he is the founder medical director at sharp sight centers he has a world class eye care in countries abroad like africa 
main main interest is anterior segment surgeries performed over more than 70000 surgeries he has conducted numerous live surgical demonstrations abroad and in india so he is a dj for us for the <laughs> for all he is always there so as he is so he has a very good uh, topic which he is going to speak about and that is technique technology and skill masala mix so it's a mix dj mix for him dr kamal uh, thank you thank you dr rohit um, i think i must say thank you dr namrata dr mahipal gaurav for giving me this opportunity the only issue i have is i'm still dabbling what topic to speak on because before me dr tetyal talked about a posterior polar and i actually wanted to show my technique of dealing with posterior polar which have pre existing uh, openings complete opening from one equator to another equator through and through so i thought i might change the topic so i have another topic where i show my famous inverted t technique so i'm still dabbling but i guess i'll go with the polar technique because i saw some people ask about uh, uh, the what would we do if we had a pre existing opening so i would say uh, i'll go with that topic to start with so this is what it is i call it the tech masala mix for the simple reason because uh, you need a good machine you need a set of skills and you need to have a good combination of both and here is a case uh, uh, one of the recent few cases this was a very good quality recording so i, I thought i'd bring it on the patient reported to me with both sides bilateral pre existing pc opening one edge to one edge i have no financial uh, interest in anything i talk about i'll be talking about some cannulas which are designed by me some or other methodologies so we will start uh, with the the surgical video i'll fast forward a lot of steps because it's actually a 12 minute video so we did publish this uh, in 2009 and we modified this technique we've actually done nearly 600 cases till now this is the case where we see this is the pc opening the pc is open from at least 11 o'clock to 5 o'clock complete so i start by making an oval capsular axis now the oval capsular axis is a big advantage for me in case uh, i do the d technique which of course i'll be trying to show in this video i can flip the d segment of the nucleus through this oval and in case there is a pc rent which of course we know there is a pc opening in this we utilize to keep the iol in the sulcus as we see it's a completely oval rexus now the way this is a cannula designed by me it's a 23 gauge cannula with a bevel softly be uh, beveled up i would go on to the nucleus surface and inject within the cortical plate and you will see there are small little rings forming this has to be a very gradual thing knowing that the pc is open very small bursts of cataract i think i probably we have one of the largest series in polar cataracts in 2009 nearly 600 plus cataract doing and this technique works perfect low bottle height low phaco emulsification parameters now what do i do i first shave off the whole cortical matter on top of the nucleus so you're noticing that i'm shaving off and freeing the edges what this does for me is when i want to scoop the nucleus out there's a complete path which is open for the nucleus to come out so here i'm going to do a complete nuclear disc pull out so i will engage with the phaco tip high vacuum very low phaco nudge it bevel it and make another i have loosened it up now i'll get it into the anterior chamber and since i have an oval rexis i just take it off as you would take a flat tire off a rim of the car now this is where the machine helps me i'm using an aps mode in my nidec machine what it does for me is it holds on to the piece and the moment the occlusion is about to break or just breaks i just lose the vacuum so i don't have the pc rushing up to my uh, phaco tip you will notice i will show the last piece i will there's a little small piece which you see now see and there is no surge because the moment the occlusion breaks the pc doesn't come up to rise now the second important step for the people who are watching is to know that before you pull out the instrument you push in in a scoelastic but don't push in a lot of scoelastic otherwise you will be opening the anterior vitreous face and you will have the cortical plate go inside next step is to remove the cortical plate i am a very big, big fan of coaxial irrigation aspiration so start with the subincisional area because when you do the subincisional area this is one of the most tough places to hang so do that first then i do a centripetal irrigation aspiration again described by us uh, in the article you pull each side 
to the center but never pull out the whole cortical plate the cortical plate once you notice i'm peeling all the edges and just like a flower petal which is attached in the center then when finally everything is detached now i just go on a high vacuum and i flip it with the flick of my wrist and get the whole cortical plate up and you see that the posterior polar cataract is coming up and the moment this is up we will see a complete pc opening there it is now don't panic we already know it is there so i don't come out i continue with my coaxial irrigation aspiration again a very good set of a machine to do this for you it should be very predictable you notice during the whole procedure the anterior vitreous face is not disturbed because i am not aspirating at a full blast i have a low flow rate a moderate vacuum and i'm just peeling the cortex in towards the center making sure i'm working only at the iris plane now once this is done you can still see the posterior capsular flap flipping there there is no fluid going into the vitreous the vitreous face is still intact and i am continuing doing my irrigation aspiration so this needs skill and of course you need a technology to help you here here we using both now the most tricky part again of this cortical plate though we have loosened it in the sub incisional area but that will be giving me some trouble again but since i know i've already freed that in my first step so i'm not much bothered about it i'll just fast forward the video slightly here now somebody can use a bimanual irrigation aspiration it's their call i am more comfortable with coaxial yes i do use bimanual also sometimes now this is the last piece is going to come out again as it comes out there is no surge i'm just peeling the last piece and i just slow down slowly motion pull it away and you see the pc is broken there's no vitreous everything is perfect now before i withdraw my irrigation aspiration to exit canva i push in viscoelastic again remember do not push a lot of viscoelastic because you will be pushing this viscoelastic into the vitreous now now i have a oval rexis with now i will start doing a vitrectomy here making sure i didn't put enough viscoelastic initially so that i have enough anterior chamber distension i will just remove the vitreous i'm trying to go a little bit fast here now i inject very small little bit of methyl cellulose under the iris just to create enough space with the 27 gauge cannula what this does for me is it creates a space between the iris and the anterior capsule because i'll be going in for a in sulcus implantation in this case i did not want to do a posterior capsule a, a, a capture on the anterior capsule because since this rupture was huge i was afraid that when i try to put it behind the anterior capsule have an anterior uh, capture i might have an extension so i decided to go in for a complete sulcus implantation and enlarge the wound and i use a three piece uh, lens my personal favorite is a technis now as i go in and make sure that the leading loop is going running parallel behind the rs and i have created enough space there while i put the lens in now as the lens is opening i wait for the lens to open 3 by 4 once this is done i slowly dial the lens in place now once this is done we use a myotic i just want to make sure whether there's no vitreous because the vitrectomy was done there's no vitreous there i just jump the video okay we just i'm jumping the video now now before suturing i will put a little amount of viscoelastic just under the wound i have hydrated the wound with i jumped the step for hydrocortisone injection now what we just put a little bit of viscoelastic and this is to make sure while i'm suturing now i don't want the chamber to collapse so i just put a little bit of viscoelastic just under the wound and i do my suturing i complete the suture i embed the suture in and now i use a little bit of viscoelastic under the side port i come from the another opposite side port to do a iridectomy now this is again done i i did put some viscoelastic there under the side port to push the iris down so i could get a good grip to do a pi i do a viscoelastic removal with the 27 gauge cannula and this is how the case turned out to be so this is uh, something about the machine what we used in this particular case was i call it the kps now what happens is the moment occlusion breaks first of all the moment occlusion happens the machine starts ramping up the frequency and the duty cycle of the feco now this is how it happens you see a slow rise time the moment occlusion starts happening the pump starts moving slowly and then the pulsations duty cycle and the pulse frequency goes up and the moment the frequency occlusion breaks 
the whole thing comes down. So for especially in the case like I did before, I think this technology really helped me. So I guess this is a good combination of tech of masala mix. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kamal, for an excellent talk. I think uh, it was really outstanding how you managed uh, in the presence of a pre-existing defect. Uh, you took into account and made an oval rexis. And the most important thing was that you placed it, uh, you know, 90 degree to the plane of the, you know, the tear of the posterior Absolutely. Cap. Yes. So, I, I, I have a question for Dr. Kamal. Uh, this was a posterior polar in which, you know, it was not communicating. I mean, there was no, although it was open, but the disc of your epinucleus was not communicating with the open posterior capsule. And so you could just take it out and crozel it out and then eat it, you know, uh, midway between. Absolutely. The, Absolutely. But, but if it is a type three posterior polar cataract, which uh, Professor Tetyal had demonstrated, I mean, I'm saying in retrospect, because obviously at that time there was no, no ASOCT, would you still do it or would you, you know, uh, would you then try to do it, you know, below the iris plane rather than at the above the iris plane by pulling it out or would you just do it in C2, uh, uh, you know, inside the uh, capsular bag itself? Okay. Professor uh, Tukyan is there, sir? Uh, Namrata, I, I, if I have an access to an ASO city, yes, things would have probably been different, but I would probably still approach it the same way because... Uh, uh, I have, we've done a lot of surgeries of this kind, and this was one of the recent cases I did only a few months ago, and this was a very good quality recording, so I used it. I have some older recording with, with grade four cataracts, with also the, the, the posterior pull cortex going behind, but with the technology of pulling it up, yes, then the vitreous does come up in those situations, but we've never lost the cortical plate. Only one case, we lost it, and I had my posterior segment surgeons come and take care of it. So this technique of scooping the nucleus and a centripetal irrigation aspiration of the cortical plate is very, very beneficial. And we also use Dr. Chang's technique of viscodissection, letting the anterior chamber slightly flatten out, get a space between the anterior capsule and the cortical plate, push slight amount of viscoelastic and just scoop it out with a blunt instrument. Dr. S. Bharti, would you like to add something for, for that matter? And would you do it uh, the same way or would you employ a different methodology for this? Dr. There's one question which is coming up, you know, again and again, and that was there in the previous presentation also. If there's an open capsule like this, how many people would put a toric intraocular lens? And that came even when Dr. Tetyal was presenting his posterior polar, you know, cataract. Okay. Uh, I think, uh, okay, Dr. Bharti, sir. Sorry. Yeah, thanks. Let's, after Dr. Bharti's comment, we can take this up. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, I think in all these cases, even if you do not have the intraoperative OCT, I think the pre-op anti-segment OCT is the tool which I would like to use in all these cases, definitely. <coughs> and uh, that will give us a re decent idea as to whether we have an open tool and uh, whether this uh, the posterior plate and is falling you know, inside the vitreous or not. So that's one factor which is very important. Of course, you can see everything while you're doing a flex and you have those OCT pictures and uh, that's not a big deal. What is in front of you or what you're expecting and then you can manage it accordingly. But uh, anti-segment OCT, I think uh, Kamal and everyone, they have it in their Center. So this is first tool which I would like to you know, use in all these cases. Uh, the second thing is uh, sometimes you are very lucky in all these cases where despite the fact that there are uh, reasons for um, uh, the nucleus or the uh, epinucleus to drop, the vitreous face is very strong and uh, it doesn't rupture and, and uh, all those factors which are there your luck and everything and then it doesn't fall in the vitreous and you can you know get uh, out of it without any serious problems but uh, this is not something which can happen time and again so one has to be very cautious and uh, like posterior polar cataracts we have already seen and uh, there are a lot of comments on that but uh, definitely one thing which i would also do is the oval rexes 
because uh, uh, perpendicular to the tear, uh, if you do over access, you are in a situation where you can manage it much, much better as compared and then visco, uh, you know, uh, visco separation and uh, those 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 two uh, things which I would definitely you know like to do all in all these cases. Yes, and Chan, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to uh, maybe just highlight some of the really important principles from that excellent case. And, and they apply to if you have a, a PC rupture like you do here. Uh, it could also be an anterior capsule tear out. It could also be a vitrectomy where you think the posterior capsule has possibly been punctured. And what he did is two things. You don't put a stress on the bag so you don't rotate and you don't sculpt. And then you try to get the nuclear pieces out as quickly as possible so that you're doing it in the anterior chamber or in the uh, iris plane. Uh, many of us uh, are so worried, we wanna make sure the CCC diameter is small enough to support a lens in the sulcus. So uh, that uh, wouldn't work to maybe bring out the whole nucleus, but remember that you can just chop it horizontally in half and then take out both hemi-nuclei much in the same way if your CCC diameter is smaller. But the principle or you try to avoid the sculpting and you try to avoid the nuclear rotation. And that's why it works so beautifully. Okay. I'd like, can I add something? Yeah, sure, please go ahead. Uh, uh, I think I agree with Dr. Chang. Uh, in this article, which we which I mentioned, I did describe the D-segment hemi-nucleotomy for grade four posterior polar cataracts with PC, posterior segment opening. And no rotation, just holding with the vacuum with the phaco tip bent sideways, pulling it out of an oval rexis so the D segment comes out out of the order oval rexis, even if you have a large nucleus. So it works perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Can I quickly respond to one uh, comment? Uh, Kamal, uh, I mean, excellent surgery. Excellent. Absolutely excellent. Uh, the only thing that I would uh, like to mention here is while you are doing the irrigation aspiration. So uh, in these situations, the bimanual holds a lot of promise. It has more control. And uh, you can actually take the sub-incisional uh, cortical matter out uh, very easily. The other thing is, instead of putting in the irrigation, the fluid, you can place in viscoelastic uh, mm -hmm. methyl mm -hmm. from the side and do a dry aspiration. Absolutely. And thereby maintaining the ruptured posterior capsule in that same plane gradually placing in the viscoelastic so that that plane does not waver and the rupture does not extend or the vitreous does not come. So I found uh, these uh, small things a little um, quite uh, you know, useful. Point Richard wants to say something, yeah. Such a quick one. Uh, why did you do it? You had preserved the anterior hyaloid beautifully. Yeah. What, why did you feel the need to do a vitrectomy? So, because by the time I was finishing my irrigation aspiration, I could see the hyaloid started bulging it when I came out with my irrigation aspiration. And I was sure because when I'm going to go in with my uh, three-piece lens, sometimes if the loop is slightly tricky, you know, a lot of times you can't predict the way the loop is opening, it would probably bulge the vitreous at that point and I would be in a little trickier situation. So, I just wanted to be a little bit more careful. So, I just did a vitrectomy and then I went ahead. So, just... To be doubly sure, because I have one case similar. Uh, we don't have enough time. I've got loads of videos uh, where I did the similar thing. Hyaluronic was intact. The three-piece lens started opening. The loop went behind the iris, but the lens opened inclined, and that the, the lower edge of the eye well broke the face, and the lens started sinking in. So just I anticipated from my last experience. I said it's a good idea to do a protect me before I go in with the lens, then to make a mess of things inside the eye. Thank you, Kamal. Now we move on to the next one. Time constraint is definitely there. Well, we have now with us Larry Benjamin, who has been kind enough to you know, agree to be part of this webinar. His specializations include complex cataract surgery, lens exchanges, diaptic retinopathy, including the use of early vitrectomy to control the retinopathy. He has helped to set up the Microsurgical Skills Training Center at the Royal College of Ophthalmologists in London. So he's the chairperson of the education committee at the college for the last four years. So he would be talking up a, taking up a very important talk, which would be vitreous loss, taming the enemy. Over to Larry, please. 
Thank you very much. And thank you for asking me to talk. Um, a very esteemed faculty, it's uh, an honor to be asked to join. Um, can you share, see my screen at the moment? Uh, oh, Larry, we cannot. We cannot. Not. I'm pressing the share screen button, but nothing's happening. Oh, hang on a sec. Try that one. Uh, yes, uh, now, now we are sharing. Okay, lovely. Thank you. So, um, why is this important? Well, as you know, cataracts is the commonest surgical procedure in the world, uh, roughly 8 million cases worldwide a year. And if the incidence of posterior capsule rupture and vitreous loss is somewhere between 1% and 2% for experienced surgeons, this is almost a pandemic. It's about 160,000 cases a year with an increased risk of site-threatening complications. So this is a workload that we don't need and certainly that the patients don't want. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the risks. Uh, they are, as you, as you all know, I'm sure, suprachoroidal hemorrhage, systolic macular edema, endophthalmitis, glaucoma and retinal detachment. And, and thinking of retinal detachment, the incidence of uh, retinal detachment, the increased risk is about 40 times higher after vitreous loss during cataract surgery. So it's a significant increase in the risk. I'm going to talk very briefly about prevention. Two things have made a huge difference in my unit in, in England. Now, one is risk stratification. And what we do for that is we use the uh, information gained from the National Cataract data set. And John Sparrow in Bristol, Professor Sparrow, did a lot of work um, looking at analyzing that data set. And these are the risk factors that are proven to cause an increased risk of posterior capsule rupture, vitreous loss. So even an inability to lie flat gives you a small increased adjusted odds ratio. Right down to the bottom there, you'll see trainee surgeons. It's nearly four times as common for a trainee surgeon to lose vitreous. So using these factors, we constructed a scoring form and whenever we list a patient for cataract surgery, we have the factors down here and the scores uh, are added up. And if the score is three or more, then that patient is allocated to a senior surgeon with experience um, to make sure they do the case. Uh, we looked at the um, uh, about 27,000 cataract operations performed across uh, three, uh, two, two time periods, one three years before we introduced this form and three years after. And we found... Uh, that we had a statistically significant drop in the vitreous loss rate by 20% after the introduction of the risk scoring form. And this was due mainly to the trainee surgeons. This was their incidence of, of cataract surgical uh, posterior capsule rupture rate dropped dramatically simply because they were being given the appropriate cases now and the more complex cases were being given to more experienced surgeons. So that worked extremely well. The second thing was the introduction of a silicon tipped IA probe. When we looked at our vitreous loss data, we found that the main two times that we were losing vitreous during cataract surgery were uh, once we had pieces, the FACO2 segment, if you like, and irrigation aspiration. They were the two commonest times. Once we introduced a silicon tipped IA, that's now reduced to zero. We no longer lose vitreous during irrigation aspiration uh, at all. And here's just a, a, a quick video showing why that is. This is actually a case of a lens exchange with severe posterior capsular pacification. And if I uh, move this on quite a lot and until the IA starts. You'll see that the, the silicon tip is extremely gentle, and even if it catches the capsule, which you'll see in a moment, it just wrinkles it and then lets go again. So it's, it's a very safe procedure. Uh, it's a nice coaxial instrument and extremely gentle on the capsule. There are one or two reported cases in the literature of, of uh, capsules breaking with this uh, probe, but it's always been due to um, a faulty uh, machining where the metal inside comes into contact with the capsule. So with an intact probe, uh, you never break the capsule anymore with, with these. What if you do break it? Well, we all know that that happens. Um, and just uh, really to uh, cement in your minds what the vitreous looks like, this is a human eye in which orange paint has been injected. This is Jan Verst who did this. Um, and I want you to keep this image in your mind. This is the vitreous body, which, uh, you know, is not just a single strand of vitreous, it's a huge complex uh, mass of tissue in the eye, all interconnected and keep that in your mind without vitreous loss. This slide I borrowed from my good friend Brian Little. Uh, this is his eight point plan for uh, managing vitreous loss. Obviously we talked a bit about prevention, it's a big topic. Very important to have a very short denial phase, don't pretend it hasn't happened. 
Um, don't panic because your performance goes right down if you panic. There's a very good study showing that uh, a panicking surgeon does less well. Um, and the main thing really is this, don't pull on the vitreous because if you pull on the vitreous, remember the orange paint picture, you pull on the vitreous base, you'll open up postural breaks and you'll get a retinal detachment. So how do you avoid it? Well, you visualize it and we'll talk about that. Then you remove it and obviously follow the patient up. What you don't do, um, you'll see this uh, surgeon here uh, has firstly, I think, made the mistake of leaving the second instrument in the eye during the last stages of FACO. This destabilizes the anterior chamber. You get lots of eddy currents. And if you watch now, he's chasing the pieces. And there, you'll see these striations. He's just caught the posterior capsule. It happens in the blink of an eye. And um, the, now is, is what uh, Dr. Kapoor did very elegantly in the previous um, surgical videos you stabilize the anterior chamber by injecting a viscoelastic because at the moment you can save this situation by just rounding out this posterior capsular tear, making a posterior capsular exit, putting an implant in and you're home and dry. But watch what this surgeon does. They panic a bit, take the instruments out and then bang, posterior hyaloid uh, or the anterior hyaloid ruptures, posterior capsule break extends and you've now got vitreous in the anterior segment and a 40 times increased risk of retinal detachment. So if you see it happen, you've got to maintain the anterior chamber stability to prevent this happening, um, and then identify the vitreous and then remove it with a vitrector. Now, we used to do a lot of this, and I would urge you never to do this again. Uh, this is a wet cell sponge and it's pulling on the vitreous, and this act is enough to open a break in the post-oral retina uh, and cause a retinal detachment. And some manuals still make them, but the eye is open, the dynamics are all wrong, there's no closed chamber, it's a very uncontrolled situation. So uh, I would urge you to avoid that. The other thing I would urge you to do is to always think of using triamcinolone, and this video is really just to demonstrate that. This is a patient with a lens coloboma, and they're having cataract surgery, and you'll see that once the, there's a capsule tension ring placed, and once the cataract is out, which is at this point here, everything looks lovely. But the surgeon decides to put some triamcinolone in just to check. And once you put it in and then wash it out, anything that's left is vitreous. So that huge wadge of vitreous uh, you can see in the anterior chamber uh, was completely unnoticed before the triamcinolone went in. And that demonstrates beautifully the, the purposeful use of triamcinolone to make sure you visualize the vitreous. Uh, this then uh, it's an old video no to the to use to remove it. Nowadays we'd use by a manual. Uh, then the IA can be done safely, and then the surgeon checks again, and there's more vitreous in the anterior segment. Now, if you put an implant in at this stage, these strands of vitreous will wrap around the legs of the implant and again cause a post or retinal break. Uh, so more vitrectomy, and then the lens will go in very safely and center very nicely because there's no vitreous in the way. So trimsin alone is essential to visualize the vitreous. There are surgeons who think they can see it. And believe you me, they can't. You're all looking through your vitreous at the moment. It's invisible. Uh, so it is important to visualize it using an adjunct. Uh, it is in the UK, we most often use uh, Kenalog, which is a, a preserved version. Uh, but you can buy in Trasanol, Triessence and Trivirus. These are preservative free uh, and use them in the same way. I usually dilute it five to one with one, one part uh, triamcinolone to five parts BSS, inject it into the eye and uh, it sticks the and the other important thing is doing an anterior vitrectomy is that in the old days when the eye was open, as I showed previously, the danger was that if you put the fluid into the eye with a coaxial vitrector, you would wash a whole lot more vitreous out. Nowadays, using a closed eye and a closed anterior segment, uh, you can leave the bottle height where it is. It doesn't need to come down because there is actually no flow until you get a change in pressure. And you don't get a change in pressure until you start aspirating. So leave the bottle height high set the uh, vitrector to cut aspirate. That means when you put your foot on the pedal, the first thing that happens is the vitrector starts to cut and then it starts to aspirate. If you have it the other way around, all you're doing is sucking on the vitreous and pulling it into the vitrector and you will again open up post-oral breaks. Have the cut rate as high as it will go. Modern machines, seven, 8,000 cuts a minute. Just put it up to maximum. Um, and vacuum 250, 300 is usually adequate. And then you can actually, if you're, if you're doing a vitrectomy and you have bits of lens mass there, you can actually switch the cutter off 
and use the vitrector to do irrigation aspiration to take out the residual soft lens matter. And then again, switch it back on to do more vitrectomy if you need to. So this in summary is, is what it looks like. You can use the main wounds to inject the triamcinolone, but don't use the main wound for the vitrector. Make two side ports uh, and put the unsleeved vitrector through one and the uh, irrigation through the other. You've then got a closed chamber. It's a very controlled pressure system uh, and you can remove vitreous. You can see it easily. You can remove it under a controlled fashion uh, and, and make sure you're not exerting any uh, anteroposterior traction uh, with your vitrector. We all do this, you know, once or twice a year if we're lucky, um, if we have a low vitreous loss rate, the trainees more commonly. So how do you practice this? We all know that you don't get good at anything until you practice it. And we only practice this once or twice a year. So nobody's very good at it. Uh, we did a video of uh, the Oxford Regional trainees um, on our training day. And they're all in the theatre with the consultants. We have model eyes um, and we can do a fake homosification with the, the standard machine. Uh, you can then break the posterior capsule and do an anterior vitrectomy uh, and we inject egg white into the back of the eye which is a vitreous substitute. You can stain it with triamcinolone and everybody can have a go at doing the vitrectomy, setting up the machine, knowing what the parameters are. Uh, you can see that I'm actually being a bit selfish and uh, hogging the limelight a little bit but eventually I do get off the chair and other people sit down and have a go at practicing the vitrectomy. We use uh, these model eyes that you can now uh, purchase from simulated ocular surgery website. I have no financial interest in this, but these model eyes you can do virtually anything with. You can take out cataracts, you can do squints, you can practice glaucoma surgery, uh, and obviously phaco and anterior vitrectomy. So uh, it's a very good way of practicing the skill before you actually start to do it on your life. So in summary, two preventative things, silicon tipped IA and risk stratification have been two things which have, as I say, my unit have reduced the incidence of posterior capture rupture of vitreous loss by 20%. And then on the management side, make sure you keep the anterior chamber stable. This business of, of inflating with the viscoelastic to keep the posterior chamber stable is important. Use triamcinolone, uh, use a separate infusion, infusion and vitrector, and make sure you've got the vitrector set on cut IA and a maximum cut rate. And if you do all that, the results can be just as good as if it never happened at all. Thank you very much. Dr. Namrata, you have probably the best uh, educating system for I'll the post -credit. sharing my screen. So uh, do you have this risk uh, stratification system for the PGs when you get them going into the equimulsification procedures? I think uh, we have can't a hear you at the moment, sorry. No, yeah. try again. We have a National Surgical uh, Skill Development Center and uh, Professor Tatyal is the chairperson for that. And I would request him to, you know, tell us about how uh, the risk stratification is done. There's, it's a very robust and a very well-organized, very well-structured system for the postgraduates. Sir? Dr. Tatyal, sir. So you have to unmute yeah. yourself. Yeah, thank you, Namrata. I think uh, for a trainee's uh, wet lab uh, situation is very, very uh, critical to you know, groom these uh, young people to our live surgeries. And we have a system where uh, people have to go through a step-by-step -step, uh, learning entire uh, surgery and their skill has to be tested. And we uh, make sure that they go through all the training and uh, pass the exams. And uh, then uh, they can do a live surgery. Then after live surgery, also their videos are taken back and reassessed by the faculty and discuss each and every point. So that will uh, give us the risk assessment for these people because it's not only the wet lab training which is uh, important. Ultimately, they have to translate into the you know, actual surgery. There only risk assessment can be done. And these videos are taken back to the faculty and mentor. They discuss each step. And then again, if there's some deficiency, they go, go through the steps of wet lab again. That is how we uh, uh, mentor these people for uh, life surgeries. I think, I, think, uh, I think Dr. Rohit at Center for Sight also, they have a wet lab uh, with the Professor Mahipal. And just I may also add that we've also at AIOS headquarters planned a wet lab uh, at the beginning of this term, but because of the COVID, we could not uh, you know, complete it. So sir, would you want to say something? 
So that's exactly what I was wanting to say. But what Namrata said is that we have already finalized with Zeiss uh, the setting up of a wet lab. Also, there will be certain equipments, diagnostic equipments, which will be there. Plus, we are getting the retina thing also in due course of time. But unfortunately, the lockdown came. Otherwise, uh, we would have implemented for any AIOS member, and there will be fellowships, etc. Uh, people can come for three days, four days, etc. And they can uh, there will be a trainer from Zeiss uh, who uh, will be there. So definitely, I think uh, uh, the lead was taken by uh, the RP Center and other institutions. We also have. I think it is very very important that. uh you learn these skills and nuances of doing certain uh, steps and almost all these steps on uh, the animal side etc so i think hopefully in the next couple of months the uh, wet lab at aios headquarter in karkar duma would be uh, up and running that's really good good to hear i think i think i've always been impressed by how efficient uh, india is in organizing these things nationally and if you look around the rest of the world um there's very little formal training in in the management of vitreous loss so i think it's it's a vital thing really Uh, because managed well it can as you know lead to good results managed badly <clears throat> we say it can cause an epidemic of of uh, poor patients really so uh, well done running to david david uh, in your practice you are taking up the posterior vitrectomy for the vitreous loss or you are still continuing with the anterior approach for the vitrectomy david Uh, yes, no. We uh, are still doing anterior vitrectomy. I think unless you have uh, posterior segment surgical training, you know, we probably shouldn't be doing that. Um, I just want to compliment uh, Larry on an elegant uh, presentation, and I, I want to highlight the uh, he made about practice and rehearsing. You know, when you mentally rehearse all the steps instead of denying that this will ever happen to me. You'll be much more prepared and much more uh, less likely to panic. Uh, and I actually, uh, with our residents, I actually have them mentally rehearse the conversation with the patient after the complication, because uh, I think sometimes what uh, changes our judgment is we're so afraid of having to tell the patient and, and talk with the patient about a complication that it's sort of. Uh, maybe forces us to be a little more aggressive about trying to salvage a situation. And uh, I think if the worst thing is having to talk to a patient, you can mentally rehearse that and you can talk about, you know, what are the things you're going to say because once you've gone through that and confronted that, you realize, well, I can do this and I can get through that and maybe then uh, I don't have to fear uh, you know, managing the complication. I agree. Thank you for those comments. I I, I think also, um, as well as rehearsing the conversation, um, it's it's very important to um, uh, when, when managing this. Um, I've just I've forgotten what I was going to say to you now, but um, I, I think that that uh, issue of of re rehearsing the the conversation with the patient is important. Um, I think also people are so worried about dropping a piece of nucleus. Uh, that like it's the end of the world, and in fact, in, in my view, it's actually much safer to uh, allow a piece of nucleus to drop, tidy up the front of the eye with triamcinolone and a vitrector, and then hand it on to a, a VR surgeon, and, and they get extremely good results. Um, so, you know, this great worry about preserving preserving every last detail of anterior segment anatomy, again, we can teach that that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is to to do it safely. Uh, yeah. Would you take over from now? Yeah, yes, uh, thanks. Uh, uh, the wonderful uh, tips from uh, Dr. Larry Benjamin on how to handle uh, vitreous losses. And uh, our next speaker, I would like to introduce uh, somebody I've known for a long time. And uh, just add a word, like, like if sure. you need. Y yes, Richard, please go on. Uh, I think we've lost him. Is it? Okay, so I'll go on with the introduction. Sorry. I think it's very important, and the nursing staff to have available to them all of the things that you're likely to need, so that they're readily at hand. They don't have to go searching for them. Absolutely. Okay, uh, I think we lost Richard's audio there again, and I'll I'll take this opportunity to introduce uh, our next speaker. Uh, Arun Gulani has been. Uh, you know an inspiration for uh, many surgeons uh, worldwide uh, he is the founding director of gulani vision institute uh, ceo of the gulani surgical suites headquartered in uh, jacksonville florida 
it's uh, fondly known as the da vinci of uh, eye surgery for his artistic uh, surgical skills he's a man of vision for his relentless pursuit of vision beyond 2020 and uh, you know com- uh, known as dr gq for his immaculate uh, dress sense and fashion and of course he tries to pass that on to his patients as well as i saw recently he is listed in the forbes uh, among top 10 laser vision surgeons in the usa uh, he's been a personal friend and uh, i enjoy his uh, you know meticulous uh, management of each patient as they come and uh, delivering the best to them so arun uh, let's uh, enjoy what you have to share with us today thank you so much uh, garav and uh, I'd like to thank all of you dr michael dr uh, namrata um dr rohit for the invite it's a pleasure being here first of all wish you all a very happy fathers day if you wondered where i disappeared i was cutting cakes and uh, having that too let me just get you the screen i don't see the screen share Not the screen share is uh, down the green button. Yeah, yeah. Uh, He's yeah, quite yeah. used to doing that, I think. Uh, yeah, he's used to doing it. <laughs> so, uh, meanwhile, that question about the open uh, posterior polar, which is open, how many of you would put toric iols while a doctor? Uh, I would never do that, Namrata. I, I knew you were going to ask that because if you have an uncontrolled uh, break in the posterior capsule, which you cannot convert into a, you know, primary posterior, I mean, a, a, a rexus, I would not want to put. Posterior polars are known to break in a, you know, extend end to end. uh let's say about, dr david what about dr david chang yeah i think for a uh, a lower power for sure if it were my eye i would just want a astigmatic keratotomy or something like that at the end i think there are situations where it's not end to end and if i had a high power astigmatism and i think if i were the patient what would i want i i wouldn't mind if someone took a shot at it because i think the worst thing that happens is it it it's not aligned or it's subluxated it could always be removed and replaced but i'm only speaking about myself but if i needed like a t5 uh, a higher amount a lot of times you can get that to line up quite well now we're only talking about monofocal not a presbyopia correcting but certainly for a low power g was an astigmatic keratotomy works very well can you see the screen now we can't uh, no i don't know we still can't see it dr kal sir what what would be your take on that as uh, while uh, arun is trying to put his share his screen yeah as uh, david said you know it depends on the case to case as far as i'm concerned i have a you know uh, opening in the posterior capsule and the vitreous face is intact and it's a linear uh, you know through and through uh, opening also i might uh, put uh, i would put up a uh, toric iols because that is indicated for that particular case yeah. so in that way as we discuss uh, discord is the best viscoelastic in these open capsules and tamponading them and i will open the lens in the anterior capsule and put the you know haptics in the orientation where they have to be and gently slide the hap- slide the haptic just underneath the anterior capsule and the lens will not have to rotate it too much otherwise rotation will create a lot of problem in these cases thank you sir yeah I think uh, we have arun on arun you can start please thanks excellent thank you so may i encourage all eye surgeons who are watching this seminar to go a little higher in your strike surgery is great but it doesn't correlate with vision you must aim for vision surgery becomes secondary like driving or cooking it just happens and your focus on vision will change your life and those of your patients to unleash vision I want you to focus on this particular slide. These are everyday patients at my institute, done by brilliant surgeons all over the world. Surgeon's notes explain a well-centered lens or a great-looking transplant or smooth topography. Patients are seething with anger because they are not seeing 2020. Again, excellent surgery. The direction is vision. All of these patients can be corrected very easily. That's what I'm going to share with you. What I really want to share today is let's talk beyond surgery all the time. So the target is vision. it's not surgery surgery what i tell patients is my excuse to get there i have to drive the car over the hill but my destination is what's my focus surgical acrobatics doesn't equal to vision patient satisfaction vision is what our focus has to be and then walk backwards to surgery work further backwards to technology look at all these patients and these are the slides these are patients from nine countries 11 states in one day 
All of these patients are seeing 2020. So please look at the slide pictures up there. All of these patients referred for transplants and other major surgeries to be done. Four minutes, please. Let's keep going through this. I call this stop the train wreck. It's all about attitude, all about attitude. Do not get so consumed with the posterior subcapsular cataract that you forget keeping the chamber height low, keeping the iris of the capsule to prevent posterior block because most of these patients have myopia and taking them with the plying technique to excellent vision is the end point. Taking patients like these who come in, one-eyed patient, anterior posterior capsule completely adhered, partially absorbed, traumatic cataract with VR surgery. To me, what is important is not the surgery of anterior excess, posterior excess, or putting the lens in, which I did. It's the next day when this guy dresses up like this and is seeing 2020. That's what I want every eye surgeon to be addicted with. There is no need to see this eye next day because you see the way he's dressed, and he wanted this picture to put on his Facebook. Now, I want to share with you, patients do not come to you for surgery. Let's get this repeated. Again, all of you amazing surgeons here, some of my very dear friends. Patients do not come to you for surgery. They come for vision. And if they've had a bad outcome, they're really not looking for surgery. They wish there was a pill they could take. So what you have to deliver is vision and the experience. They're going through post-surgical stress syndrome. They don't trust anybody. And when they are flying to me at this point, they've been through some mar marvelous surgeons, but they all missed the point. I want you to see this because in every surgery, in every presentation of mine, I show you patients. I believe that is the highest accountability, not a white paper, a real fully paid patient who wants to go and explain their life to the whole world that is true outcomes. Why is this patient right in surgery who's had 10 previous surgeries in Abu Dhabi? Why is he saying he's happy? Fantastic. Hear him, please. He's in surgery. Super. Super. That's what you want, the patient experience. This is the 11th surgery. Every patient of mine is topical, no drugs, no IV sedations, no IV prick at all. The night of surgery comes, he rents this bike, wants me to sit on his bike. That's my confidence that I can sit there. This is his 11th surgery and he's flying to Abu Dhabi next day. Why is this attorney and Coast Guard officer doing this? These are very serious people who came in very angry. Why are they doing this? I want you to please look at this and remember, it's their experience. Why is this patient on multiple surgeries from Arizona Welcome, doing this? Hi. How are you feeling? Oh my gosh, I feel remarkable. <laughs> All right, I just want you to remember this please. Patients come for vision and experience. Now, I recently gave an interview in OT, Ophthalmology Times, where I said, show me the patients. Actually, I, told, I was before Jerry Maguire when he said, show me the money. So three decades ago, I would say this to my colleagues out of jest and fun and to encourage them. I don't want to see your surgery video if you cannot show me your surgery during surgery, smiling, immediately post-op hugging you, and next day dressed to kill, trying to fly out. That to me is success. So show me the patients. These are again patients of day one, all came in with bad outcomes, all leaving with an amazing outcome. So what are the principles of a surgical strike? When Dr. Rohit sent me this title, surgical strike, I like it to be refractively oriented, not topo oriented, none of that technology, refractively oriented, visually targeted. Target is vision, not surgery. And swift and minimally invasive. And your end point is to yes. award a full blown invasive surgery. That's a surgical strike in eye surgery. Let's get that clear. It's not about going in the eyes, suturing the lenses, getting the vitreous out of posterior rexus. That is great. A surgical strike is artistic, minimalistic, visually oriented. In, G in the eye world, I had written my article on GPS. It came to me known as Galani planning system, which is you don't get into your car, start driving and see where you land. You plan your destination and take the best path and play up the music while you're getting there. So how do I approach every case from a simple myop to the most devastating surgeries that are flown to me? I always think vision. If somebody has a dagger in their eye, I tell my fellows, I want a one page report on why this patient will not be 2020. It's an attitude thing. So I first think vision, I then think surgery. Second, and last, I think technology. Meaning I walk up to my kitchen to pick up my ingredients, because now I'm crystal what I want to use. I don't debate about that. Here's the patient, let's go. I've taken three particular cases from my everyday cases to show you how I think. And these cases will line that out so we can talk about the highest strike. So here's a patient with nine surgical complications, uh, 89 micron keratometry, 23.5 astigmatism, told nothing can be done, hex K, you'll see this. And what did we do? My concept, which I'm gonna share in the next case is, I start thinking, how can I make a 2020? And no, I will not do the transplant that she was flown to me for. I will not do anything that will take me away from 2020 without glasses, please. We are eye surgeons. I don't like to discuss glasses contacts. Our attitude has to be perfection. So we first put in an intact. I don't care what intracorneal rings you use but bring the cornea to what I call measurable before we enter the sacred eye. So 23.5 to 1.4. Here's a video, I'll let the volume take over. 
This is a 75 year old nurse Can you hear who it, referred please? to me following hexagonal keratotomy with corneal ectasia, vision of crown fingers only, and Fuchs dystrophy along with associated cataract and high keratometry of 88 with high irregular astigmatism of 23.5. I planned first to stabilize and make her cornea measurable in sync for future cataract surgery. Here I'm using Intax, and as you can see me, I'm using her own corneal resistance to guide my Intax rings in place. I'm doing this without any sharp intervention, so I don't make mistakenly any incision that can go into the hexagonal keratotomy guts and perforate the cornea. Manual. Again, notice these are very determined yet very careful movements of the ring, and I'm placing them so as to embrace this central unstable island. The success of this is immediately reflected in the central light Please reflex, the central reflex. Know, which is becoming more and more circular. And I Here. call this the titratable uh, concept of intact surgery. Notice again, the light reflex is now a perfect circle. I'm extremely pleased to the I point usually that do I not do cross linking at the same time the success ever, is reflected in topography from 23.5 to 1.4 diopter astigmatism. Patient Please see the patient dressed up 60 years later. Me four months after determining stability, stability of this cornea accuracy. so we can determine accurate cataract surgery. We proceed here, trypan blue for the observing surgeons, viscoelastic exchange. Manual. I plan my capsular excess to be a smaller size so I can see the edges between the hex cake cuts and the intact reflections, and also to maintain a Remember good Remember my mindset is I want 2020. 20. I can easily do a I major surgery, with what we not call right. Phacoplastic, which is doing cataract surgery also in determined steps. Like you see, my phaco probe is not moving. It stays in I one don't place while stitch. my second hand does most of the movement stitch. to maintain a stable incision, similarly with the IA and lens insertion here. Lens is now being placed in the bag and then gently moved into its axis. Again, irrigation aspiration, well-sealed incision, further uh, reinforced More with travel. reassure sealant, no stitch to induce any astigmatism. So here we have taken a patient who was denied her vision for 60 years. In two few minutes surgeries, four months apart, we have restored her vision and her confidence to give her back her life where she's come back to nursing and helping other patients. Here she is immediately after surgery, and here is my payback, seeing them smile Without and uh, free to lead their life and help others. Once again, thank you for your attention. Even if you forget the whole surgery, please remember this picture of this lady, exophthalmos, fuchs, uh, ectasia, hex K, 23 diopters, everything I told you. This is the billion dollar I want everyone to be addicted to. Now, a quickly brush up on the clear system of mine, but I do not like doctors calling themselves cornea, LASIK, or cataract surgeon. We are all vision corrective surgeons. Clear means keratolentricle extended armamentarium, which is 48 techniques to make people see without glasses. Blur your boundaries. I want every patient at 2020. You're a master chef. Stop depending on robots and technologies. Enslave them. Therefore, my title, enslave your technology, unleash vision. You are the master chef. Take credit for it, please. So, when a strike, I would also correlate this to a bowling strike, how I think with every patient in my 5S system, I like to. Now, let's go to this case, which shows you my thinking process for every patient. Here's a patient in for a lawsuit with a surgeon, keratoconus, a premium cataract surgery done, ended with hyperopia, high case, central scar, and open PC. What would you do? Patient is 2200 and miserable, and he also was a pilot. Ks are 49. Here's how I start thinking. I start putting him into my 5S system, which I've written about three decades ago, which is how my brain thinks. I call it the mental sorter. I refuse to think about surgery. I'm thinking, what do I need to correct? So if you see these pins I have lined up, I have found in him a corneal scar, astigmatism, presbyopia, hyperopia, high keratometry. Can you see the pins down? Now that I've lined them up, I have made myself accountable to the patient. And now how do I aim for a strike? Having lined them up, I want every pin down. That's your attitude. You cannot go, this is a difficult case. I'll get two pins. I want it all. So that's the system. Having got that, here's the patient and the system and the problem. He's hyperopic, presbyopic, astigmatism, corneal scar, high case. So with my clear system, the only one surgery, remember I don't give patient options. You give them a plan, which is the correct one. You want myopic laser surgery as the only surgery that can get me all my seven pins. My dilemma. How do I do myopic surgery when he's hyperopic? So if you see this patient who was seething with anger, had his attorneys with him, had two of his surgeons in New York on the point of lawsuit, he's sitting in my office. In 20 minutes, he becomes a puppy going, wow, doc, so your problem is very simple. How will you make me myopic? I said, that's exactly right, John. You got it. 
I have nothing else to worry about. Your surgeon's done a great job. My concern now is how do I think of making you myopic? You see how all my problems funnel down to one thing? Now, how do I make him myopic? Very simple. He's a keratoconic eye, meaning deep chamber. He's got an open capsule. Remember, I can show off my surgical skills, four minutes of removing the lens and putting a new lens in. Wrong. I'll be disturbing the vitreous, no 2020 potential. So I'm going to put a piggyback lens. What I call this for this patient, I tell him, listen, here's the ticket to Paris, which you want to go to. But can we go to Iceland before that? And you have to trust me, Iceland's dark and cold. Paris is sunny and beautiful. But you got to trust me. So the patient needs to trust you and you need to trust yourself that you can take off and land two times because if I crash in Iceland, it's over. He's not going to Paris. So if you look at this concept of mine, Orlando to Paris via Iceland, you can see the ticket right up there. And what I do here is I tell him, here's where we are going and you're confident with me, even though you're shivering in Iceland, wearing, wondering what the hell am I doing here? I was supposed to go to Paris, which is 2020 vision. So I first put in a piggyback lens and actually made him worse. Do you see what happened in Iceland? The vision is worse now because I made a myopic astigmatism. And then with laser, I bring into 2020 and the patient is smiling throughout because they have to trust you on this journey as you trust yourself. So that's a concept of how you take patients, even if you're playing racquetball or carom, how you play and you bring them to 2020, it's a mental process. The biggest thing people learn from me and fellows when they come to me is the pre-op day is where I exhaust myself. The surgery cannot exceed six minutes, no matter how complex a case you send me. So this is what we did to this patient, brought him with a piggyback lens, then the laser on top, 2020. In fact, he's 2015 and he's got his license back. What does the patient remember? Three minute piggyback lens surgery, four minute laser surgery, four months apart. Now, understanding this concept, there is nothing you cannot correct. So here's the patient who had 12 previous surgeries and was written off completely, broadcaster, a news broadcaster. He's now a pastor because he couldn't see. Keratoconus, intact, PRK, PTK, LASIK, ICL, and now early cataract and cross-linking, everything. Poor vision, nothing to do with Dr. Can you do transplant? Something magical to get this guy off my back. Cannot. You have to think 2020. So because this cornea was improper, I first want always the cornea to be measurable to enter the eye. You cannot put in a cataract lens going, let me assume he'll land at 2020. That's criminal. So I first do a laser technique I'll show you. First, we do that correct the cornea, then ICL removal with aphakia. I wait because accuracy is very important. I have every technology under the sun from even before in the beta systems, but I rely on my refraction on the weekend. He in fact made me go fishing and I did that too for him. I'll never do it again, very smelly. So here's this full sequence, how he moved in his vision. This is in sequence, remove the ICL aphakia and basically bring him to 2020. Here's the surgery for you to see. In this case of 12 failed procedures, including intact PRK, PTK, cross-linking, ICL, and now cataract and anterior so don't worry about number of surgeries. Scars, Doesn't matter who did I the surgery. I first address the corneal scars in a laser corneoplastic mode. You see me peeling away the scar. To make it measurable. Total, followed by laser We cannot have an unmeasurable cornea. To a nice circular end topography in these cases. It's literally a correlates suit. with cannot. measurability. Refraction. With full confidence now, I proceed with the ICL removal and cataract surgery plan. Keeping all the principles I previously described of have to be artistic, staying artistic have to be and no minimalistic, stitches. attitude has to be adamant, ICL removal. cannot take the easy way Renegotiate out. the same previous incision, bring the ICL for a nice purchase, hold it and pull it out, keeping full control without any need to increase the incision. On bringing the ICL completely Always out, watch everything we do. place sure it on the cornea to examine for complete done. removal with no tear or any missing pieces, followed by cataract surgery. In this case, I follow and keep this patient aphakic without a lens implantation to measure to ensure even more measurability by refracting this patient aphakic next day okay. and a week later and to week follow later. with extreme confidence to even put in a toric lens implant in this patient and bring him to 2020 vision. And you can see the summary right here. Very important, please keep looking at the patient. That is the biggest way of accountability. So there is no case that you cannot do a strike on. These are patients with scars, RK, subluxated lenses, have to bring them straight to 2020. This is a fun thing my fellow did for you, uh, just to show you a surgical strike concept. And uh, how, when we prepare, I want the preparation more to be here. The planning, the surgery is easy. Plan it out like crazy the night before, then show up in your cockpit next day and do your magic. Thank you for your attention.
Uh, thanks, Arun, uh, for that wonderful presentation and uh, the uh, perfect take-home message that uh, meticulous planning and uh, you know attention to detail and uh, individualizing and customizing treatments to every patient is the key to success. And I think uh, you know one thing we learn definitely need to learn from you. Thanks for sharing those lovely cases. If any of our panelists has uh, anything, can you stop sharing your screen, Arun, so that we can have a quick discussion? And we are running much behind schedule, so we'll only take one. Uh, you know panelists to tell us, uh, you know, foot, uh, Dr. Chang, would you like to say something here? Oh, that was a, that was like a motivational, uh, lecture there. So I think, mm -hmm. uh, I, I loved a lot of the points and, uh, now I think, uh, focusing on, uh, the patient and, and not, uh, purely the, the refraction is, uh, is really good advice. Larry, would you like to, Larry, would you like to say anything there? Uh, I agree. I think I think the surgical planning is is what it's all about, and uh, clearly, you know, these good results are obtained because of the thought that goes into it. Uh, what about uh, what about good... what about intraoperative aberrometry? The systems that we have, the aura systems, especially when you're putting the intraocular lenses in these complex eyes. Doctor Arun is there? Yes. Absolutely. What is your call? What is your take on that? If you have, I, a system, you know, like aura and uh, It'll help you to, you know, titrate your lens power uh, better. Uh, as you know, I'm a beta tester for all technologies in the world. And these do not work in these cases. I have used three technologies on this. And therefore, I came up with this concept that uh, Dick McCool and me share very deeply is leave the patient aphakic. It increases your work, but that's not the point. So you saw me leaving him aphakic with cortex in the subcortical area, subincisional, day one, day week refraction, 100% 2020, even in these cases. So, Auras and all work okay in basic, simple post LASIK, post RK. They fail completely. I have seen these patients again flying to me with ORA reports from their surgeons. And my take is very simple results talk. Refraction is the way to kill this. Surgery is second, but you have to be an artist in that. Three, focus is patient. So, using any technology, because my fellows are putting together projects on this now, smooth topography, great transplant, and well centered lens do not correlate with patient happiness at all. I'm seeing that because 78% of my practice is second opinion. So Aura is great for post LASIK, post RK for delegates who are listening. It is, does not work at all for people who had 10, 12 surgeries and refraction is your hell bent point. I keep pushing a refractive surgeon cannot be a refractive surgeon unless you know how to refract. So I'll just uh, throw in one of the things we've now started in the United States since October is the light adjustable lens. Uh, this will take time to go worldwide. Uh, but this is a three-piece uh, monofocal that you can adjust several times post-operatively and you lock it in. And so uh, for these very complex cases, uh, we found this to be really the procedure of choice because you have a couple ways, a uh, couple opportunities to change it. But most importantly, also the patient can try out whether they want to be a little myopic or not, and you can reverse it. So I think uh, adjustability is really going to help us not only in our routine cases, but particularly these difficult refractive ones. Absolutely. You have to take these light adjustable uh, for eye wells. You have to take in the patient twice, thrice, or one sitting spices. Yeah, this is the first uh, iteration. So we usually have to do two adjustments and uh, one or two lock-ins. So it's a total of about three or four post-op visits. Um, I think the future iterations will be fewer. Uh, but one of the things that's nice about adjustability is we really can do both eyes at the same time because uh, we don't have to worry about uh, refractive surprises. Uh, and of course, then that cuts all the visits and the, uh, the adjustments sort of that time is cut in half. So it makes it much more efficient. The, so the patient has to wear UV blocking glasses. So again, they only have to wear it for about a month when you do both eyes at the same time. One more question. If you hit zero on the first go, so would you do any adjustment to take care of that? In the, you know, if you hit zero on the first Oh yeah. So the, uh, the, the lens technology, it's a silicone uh, lens, but, and uh, there's this mo these molecules that have to be consumed. So even though you may hit it, you still have to do what we call power neutral adjustments to consume that, and then you can uh, lock it in. 
because you have to have this reservoir of molecules to allow you to do two and sometimes even three adjustments. That's why we're able to, uh, you can actually correct almost four diopters of astigmatism uh, with that. So in actual fact, we aim a little hyperopic and then adjust, uh, you know, it's easier to go from plus to minus and sort of zero in on the target. That sounds really uh, exciting, uh, David, and I'm uh, really looking Not forward to have our hands on that. Uh, Richard wants to say something before we move on. Oh, I'm just intrigued that, David, you're uh, suggesting this is new technology. It's been around for years uh, outside the US, and nobody's really taken it up. So I'm just intrigued that you think this is going to be a big deal in the US. Yeah, I think the uh, it was only approved in Europe for a spherical adjustment. And if you can only adjust the sphere, you know, it's not worth making so many trips. Uh, but now it's, uh, we can adjust the cylinder, but you can also uh, put on an EDOF pattern. Uh, so I think, um, you know, people that are using it are finding it very good for complex cases, uh, very sort of difficult to satisfy patients and it's really the ultimate in a personal, sort of a customized mini monovision or blended monovision or whatnot. Because as we all know, it's hard to predict how much myopia a patient tolerates or wants in their second eye. And I think the concept that I could choose it by experiencing it and then reversing it or adding to it would be appealing to me if I were the patient. Uh, It'll be interesting to see uh, if when the I think we lost uh, Richard's uh, voice there. The net is poor. Um, should we move on, Dr. Rohit? Yes, I think. Dr. Suhas, please go. Ahead. Okay, I'll invite Dr. Suhas. I'll just share my screen for a moment. And it's my privilege uh, to introduce uh, someone who's been a uh, FACO pioneer and a teacher to many of us. Uh, Dr. Suhas Haldipurkar, uh, well known in India and abroad internationally for, uh, he's the founder director of the Lakshmi Eye Institute. And uh, it's a recognized center for post-graduation for DNB and DOMS and for fellowship and uh, surgical training. He has trained many fellows and uh, many fellows who did not attend at his place because uh, I remember doing my post-graduation and seeing his videos, uh, you know, for learning FACO as well. Uh, he's been recognized with the Karm Yogi Puraskar and a recipient of the Asia Pacific uh, Certified Educator in 2017. He was conferred with the Dr. Ishwar Chandra Award for Lifetime Achievements in Ophthalmology. And he has been awarded with the Best Teacher Award by the Maharashtra Ophthalmic Society and the Eye Clinic of uh, Orissa, uh, sorry, uh, Oresis. And uh, uh, Dr. Suhas is really a medical surgeon. He is an artist. And I would uh, request Dr. Suhas to please uh, share his uh, with us today. Thank you, uh, uh, Lutra and Dr. Rohit, for uh, uh, Am I on? Hello. Yes, your, your answer. Yes. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is a case of uh, advanced uh, subluxation that uh, presented to me. And uh, if you notice uh, that uh, cataract is literally hanging on few zonules there, and it's a very advanced cataract. So it certainly requires uh, a lot of uh, planning. And the one thing that's in your favor in such case is that there's no vitreous in the anterior chamber. And uh, now when you make your rexis, at times it's difficult to make and you may have to use uh, the hooks to support for counter pressure. But luckily, after injecting uh, dispersive viscoelastic, uh, very gradually I could make one. But if you notice, the capsule is so firmly stuck on the nucleus that it's difficult to get a gap between. The hydrodissection, of course, you cannot do, but to get your hooks in, 
because the only savior for you at this moment would be to fix the bag. And at times, you may have to use more than four hooks, like in this case, and those hooks really do an excellent job. Ideally, you would go for a capsular hook, but uh, I prefer to use this hook. Now, the second job ne next, uh, you know, the obstacle here is because the nucleus is extremely hard. You have to see that you, you can separate your endonucleus from the epinucleus wherever it's possible and try and get the nuclear fragments out of the bag to engage them and emulsify them. And you have to also keep injecting viscoelastic into the bag to protect your posterior capsule. You inflate the bag and this process you may have to do more than once. And I'm using my bevel down to pick a nucleus piece and bring it anteriorly and with patience and with repeated adjustments of your FACO dynamics, finally you are able to get most of it. Even at this stage, it's, it's safer to inject some more viscoelastic so that you have your final piece out. And then obviously you would clean the bag and the first next step that you do is to insert a endocapsular ring because you want a pressure on the bag which is circumferentially uh, equal. The only difference is that I, in, I uh, insert a suture into the trailing eyelet which works like a safety suture which is available to you to bail out the endocapsular ring in case the bag has to be salvaged. Now, what I plan here is to fix the bag and there are several ways to fix the bag. And what I use here is anchor, which is called ASIA anchor. This is like a paper clip. It's in one plane and it's quite sleek in a sense. Once you put it onto the rexis margin, it just slips in and the pupil or the iris can slide over it without any difficulty. What I'm doing here is that zigzag technique of suturing where that nino suture has one straight needle and at the other end you have a curved needle. So you fix the suture on either side, the ASIA anchors are fixed, your bag is stable, and then in an inflated bag, you insert your lens and be careful when you have to put in the trailing haptic. And once it is done, uh, you have the, the lens placed well in the center and uh, that's, uh, uh, that's about it. Uh, I thought of showing two cases. The sh other one is a short one and this is very interesting. It was to begin with a shallow anterior chamber. There was a lot of positive pressure and the nucleus was quite hard. And this patient was going for a toric lens. So I was very sure that I didn't want to disturb the posterior capsule at any cost. After repeated changing of parameters, it was difficult for me to continue with because I could literally see the posterior capsule literally you know, jumping into my phaco tip. So at some stage, I had to take a call and I thought, why not, you know, do something else where my FACO is 
little more comfortable than the way I'm doing at this stage. So I just thought of scaffolding it. I waited. I had to make sure that the PC is intact. And once I knew that, I stopped the fake room, got the nucleus out into the cha anterior chamber, and injected viscoelastic under the nucleus, making sure that the capsular bag was intact, and took the single piece toric lens and inserted it into the skin sulfur. Once the lens was there to protect, to protect me, it was like laying on your own ground. I could easily I go, easily ahead, go ahead, ahead and complete the FACO. And once the FACO is completed, now is the time for you to get the lens into the sulcus. and get it in place in the proper axis that you really want that lens to be. Now, this was a very simple step which we normally use when you have a PC rupture. But in this case, because of positive pressure, I adopted the same for an intact PC. Thanks, uh, Dr. Aldi Purkar, sir, for that lovely uh, video. I'll request you to please stop sharing your screen and uh, yeah. I'll, uh, <clears throat> take this opportunity to ask uh, Dr. Partha Biswas, who's again a keen surgeon using these techniques, uh, uh, how he uh, manages. You know, would you prefer to use, uh, sir, showed a very elegant way of using the iris hooks, but I would be a little scared ever since we got capsular hooks. I enjoy using them instead uh, because they support the capsular. Equator, of course, with a master surgeon, it's entirely, you know, he knows exactly how much stress to put there. So he gets away with it. But Partha? Yeah. So, uh, so excellent videos as usual, uh, teaching lessons to all of us. Uh, the capsular hook, of course, does support, as Gaurav very rightly said, the, uh, the equator of the bag. And thereby, they are more stable, as well as the, uh, the ends are more smooth and thereby might not tear a capsule uh, if required. And uh, putting in the capsular hooks and again taking them out are the most important aspects. The right time to put them in and the right time to take them out as well. And of course, to be prepared for the anchorage of the capsular bag with the, uh, with the segments. Uh, is the next important step and whenever it is called for, uh, needs to be done, sir. Thanks, Partha. Dr. Bharti, sir, uh, what's your experience with the, had you have experience with the ASI anchor or would you prefer something else uh, instead of that, sir? Showed a very brilliant, uh, you know, he showed a very meticulous way of doing the ASI anchor, but. Yeah, uh, but uh, mostly what, what we were talking about earlier was the iris hooks versus the capsular hooks. And uh, mostly capsular hooks are so easily available in every OT uh, that, uh, you know, uh, you can use uh, iris hooks for every, you know, even holding the capsule. The only issue is that uh, they tend to sometimes leave the uh, anchorage and uh, sometimes they, they're not able to hold on the rexus margin because the, the, the whole thing is so small. So that is why I think um, uh, the, the iris hooks may not work as well, but uh, I think they, they, it is possible to use them. Uh, but before that, I wanted to do a little bit comment on uh, what Arun said earlier, because that was very interesting. And uh, uh, what he was trying to achieve uh, was one shot 2020. And what uh, we were discussing later on was um, the technology which was there to in future to come in and probably doing it in multiple settings, one or two or more settings. So what, what I, I felt, um, what his uh, you know, take was to do a perfect refraction and then achieve 2020 in one go. 
and that was uh, the beauty as to the whole thing is to practically apply and then achieve uh, you know imagine and then achieve that so that is another thing which was very much uh, i wanted to you know kind of appreciate and uh, say that this kind of you know thought process is different as compared to what we are trying to do uh, in two or three or four sittings we must imagine a situation where we can achieve it in the second sitting itself and that was something uh, amazing it he always amazes me with his thoughts and uh, his uh, takes on the procedures which he want to take yeah thanks dr bhakti i think uh, we have dr richard packard you know i would like to take his opinion on what his preferences for the between the iris hooks and the and the capsular hooks and uh, between the asia anchor it's a really interesting device i've never used it myself between you and dr david if anybody has experience with them richard uh, would I you like to come first yeah use the asia anchor uh, uh, i i yeah ehud is is a good friend of mine and i think he's very innovative it's another device uh the the amit segment is another approach that you can use in this situation for an iris or any temporary situation although i think susan jacob has actually uh, patented the idea of of using an iris hook and then uh, sticking it into a uh, a pocket in the uh, in in the stirrer so I, there are lots of ways of doing this um i think it's what you feel comfortable with all of these methods are there to try and uh, support the capsule and that's the important thing So in my hand the Emmet uh, CTS works really well but we'll take David's opinion and then we'll move on to the next uh, question yeah uh, I agree uh, with uh, Richard that uh, all of these are uh, different variations of the same theme I think for the attendees the most important thing though is to use uh, ideally capsular or if not available iris retractors because just preserving the bag Uh, is the most important thing and that allows us to sort of preserve the bag during FACO and then maybe delay placement of a CTR and then whatever anchoring device you need until later but remember you need a intact CCC you need an intact bag and the uh, capsule retractors have really changed uh, this for all of us they're great i would like to ask the panelist one question in the first case david will start with you Uh, at what time would you have gone in for using the ctr yeah timing of the ctr is uh, tricky of course it doesn't really give you counter fixation to the bag it doesn't support the bag it doesn't all it does is puts it on stretch and of course it has the disadvantage potentially of trapping the cortex so i think for do- for the faco all the things we need uh are supplied by the retractors and the three of them are support in the ap direction again counter fixation this is what allows us to rotate the nucleus is it it uh, sort of replaces the lacking centrifugal stability of the zonules and then one final thing is it does help constrain the capsule of fornix from being aspirated by the phaco tip which can sometimes happen so uh so often we have zonulopathy or a dialysis and what that means is it doesn't take much force to worsen the dialysis or worsen the zonulopathy and so reinforcing it with retractors uh, to me is is the most important thing delay the ctr until as late as possible richard richard you you would you like to add something uh not particular i mean i think that david has uh, has has summed it up we're lucky to have these devices now they've transformed the surgery that we can do in the face of uh, of zonular issues and um whichever one of them you use you just need to have a system that works for you there's no right and wrong way of doing this it's just knowing when you need to use these devices and how to use them none of them are that difficult to use just to break down the basics or we all have the skills to use these things any of these complex cases that we do if you break it down into little aliquots of procedure and you understand each of those parts then suddenly complex cases become much less complex absolutely i agree so i think i'll invite uh, dr rohit omprakash sir to please introduce our next speaker i'll share the screen for you sir one moment uh, okay uh we have the last talk now and i think last but not the least uh, i'll invite uh, dr uh to please introduce our next speaker
Yeah, well, uh, I have the privilege of uh, introducing Nishant Madhibnan. He is a cornea and refractive surgeon at MNI Institute, Chennai. He has done corneal fellowship at Shankar Nitrale recently only, I would say 2013-2015. He has performed over 5,000 topical uh, phacoemulsive patient surgeries. And he has trained national and international ophthalmologists for the same, performed over 500 LASIK, FAMTO, and other uh, refractive procedures. And, you know, he has performed many penetrating keratoplasties and also other lamellar procedures as well. He has presentations at all levels, state, national, and international. You can see by his fitness, he's a state-level tennis player. Cycling and guitar, I think, complement him. Over to Nishant for his talk. Thank you. So I think we have two, two avid tennis players other than me here today. Uh, so Nishant, uh, there to I take know over. About that, uh, Gaurav, sir. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Rohit, sir, for that uh, introduction. I'm just sharing my slide. And uh, I have a plethora of eminent speakers over here. And I'm actually really going to the basics of uh, nuclear extraction. Uh, but I'm sure that every ophthalmologist has to go through the phase which I am going to talk about to become the stalwarts what all you people are. Very good evening or, or, or rather late uh, evening to all the speakers here. So we all we all really wish that surgery would be a little easy. Perfect. Like we have a push of a button where we can have the cat patch which can be in a way or make into all different types of quadrant. But before that, we should make sure that we have a proper excess of around 5.5 uh, millimeter and it should be circular so that the chances of a nuclear extraction would be much easier. We should make sure that the clear corneal incision should be perfect. And then even the hydro dissection, you can see the wave in which the nucleus is cleaved away from the cortex should always be there before we start a proper nuclear extraction. So with the NIDIC machine, which I have, these are the parameters I follow. The initial step of the nuclear extraction is the four quadrant technique, which we started with. So we should make sure that the length and the width of the, uh, this, the cross is perfect. And once you have the depth achieved, then always go for the crack. I always tell my students that do not have two, three chances. When you crack it once, it should crack. Then only you are sure that you have reached the edge of the nuclear base. So once it cracks into four quadrants with the PECOS 2 setting of the NIDIC uh, CV9000, which I have, you can see that the nuclear pieces easily come into fragmentation and PECO emulsification is possible just by keeping the uh, PECO probe in the center. And the followability of the nucleus is also as good as the aspiration flow rate is. The next I would say about the stop and chop technique where only a single trench is done. And the same way you go to the depth and crack the piece. I rotate it 180 degrees to make sure that the crack is complete before I go for the smaller quadrant removal of the nuclear fragments. While cracking, make sure that your uh, Sinsky or your dialer is just little offset of your nuclear probe and not exactly where it is holding the nucleus or you might lose the nucleus piece from the nuclear fragments. So from the stop and chop, after this, the lens, the yellow lens from the NIDEC, which is the Actus SZ lens, which is a preloaded and goes through a 2.2 incision. It is a preloaded lens. And uh, it is so easy where you just fill up viscoelastic in that hole which is given. And as you can see, the visco is completely filled. And, uh, being a double polymerization reaction, the chances of glistening is all definitely much lesser. So you can see how neatly the optic and the haptics are folded on each other. And I usually do a 2.8 and you can see how easily it goes. And being a hydrophobic lens, the chances of opening will be always slow, but this lens actually immediately opens up. And uh, that is the best. And big, uh, you can see the blast finishing of the haptics as well. So I follow the three Ds, that is drag, depress, and dial. So drag is to make sure that it comes below the anterior lens capsule, depress it, and then dial. So this is the perfect kind of surgery when you want. 
So these uh, parameters, I use it for the carousel technique as well. I use it in a high aspiration mode where sometimes with the nuclear fragments, you can even use only the aspiration and only for the core of the nucleus, you can give a little amount of FACO as well. So this carousel technique also works beautifully. For the hard cataract, I always use sometimes the modified stop uh, direct chop. So I don't directly chop, make a small trench, but not as deep as it is. But then at the end, I go and trench my FACO probe. So this helps in two ways. One, it also reduces the amount of FACO energy you are using. And two, the only problem we have is embedding the FACO probe into the core of the nucleus, which is solved by the small creator which we create. So once you get these two halves, I'm sure that all eminent surgeons are here all over the world and the rest of the fragmentation of the smaller nucleus is going to be very easy. Sometimes I even use this technique for harder cataract where I'm going to use a little bit more FACO power where I do a small tunnel with my keratome as well. So the wound integrity at the end of the surgery, even if you're using more amount of FACO energy, will be a little more much better. So this is another modified direct chop where I make a small V at the section. So this is also mainly to make sure that your FACO probe is beautifully engaged into the core and the depth of the nucleus. And once it is achieved there, I use the vertical chop and the horizontal chop for this. And then you can see how beautifully the nucleus cracks, cracks open. So once you get a single crack, which extends totally, uh, even including the posterior part of the cataract as well, other small pieces. I also use the burst mode in the NIDIC machine, which usually holds the nucleus beautifully and the amount of uh, FACO energy you use is very less. Even under the saline, these lenses are beautifully placed. They open up beautifully as uh, you can see over here. And uh, never forget the three Ds, which I say drag, depress and dial them into the bag. Just by one go, you can see it always go into the bag. And then the worst combination for any surgeon is the small pupil and the heart cataract, which is covered by most of the surgeons here. So I just wanted to say that it is not only the length, but the depth. So even if you achieve a three uh, millimeter depth, and if you go even in these heart cataracts, you will easily be able to uh, emulsify the cataract. And never go near the pupil as uh, they said that when you go near the pupil, the chances of iris shafting is more. And finally, we come to the direct chop where you actually go directly into the nucleus and then you emulsify them. This is a softer kind of an uh, intumescent cataract. So a direct chop is much preferred so that you use less amount of energy for completely removing the nuclear pieces. And then you have beautifully described uh, subluxated cataract. So as Dr. David Chang said that, yes, even I didn't place the CTR because the chances of cortex aspiration would be difficult. But after a proper trench, I actually use two instruments so that I don't give too much stress on the donules. The zonal dehiscence was around uh, two to three clock hours. So once I get that crack, which is used by two instruments and not give too much of force, even without a CTR or a hook to stabilize the bag, with the parameters a bit slow, that is the bottle height comes a little slow, the FACO energy we use is going to be much lesser you will be actually able to emulsify the cataract because the core of the nucleus is got into the and rest of the steps of the nucleus which comes out is going to be really easy. So after I remove the cortex and the epinucleus sheet and then I definitely place the CTR before I place the lens. Yes, we always, all of us, uh, I, I, I'm sure that all of us know this famous movie where we all wonder while swinging the Expecto Patrona! I thank the whole team, the panelist, AIOS, NIDEC for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much to everyone present here, sir. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Madhindan, this, this was a great uh, presentation uh, which showed all aspects of uh, nucleus being emulsified with all the techniques, uh, brilliant surgeries. Uh, I think you have miles to go and you have really come up well. I would like to congratulate you for that excellent presentation. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, 
I think uh, with this, we are practically uh, through with all the presentation. At this point of time, I would like to thank NITEC, KLB, Mr. Divakar Paul for uh, giving uh, and collaborating with AIOS and having such a beautiful session. We had the privilege of having uh, David Chang uh, getting up on a Sunday early morning and being with us. Thank you very much, David, for being kind enough to be with us. Richard, uh, you have been uh, uh, always been more than ever. Whenever we have called, you have always been there. And I think you have more following in India than you have probably anywhere else in the world. I can vouch on that. And I would like to thank uh, Dr. Namrata if she could conclude with her comments so that we can end up this excellent webinar. I think uh, we need to thank you, Dr. Rohit and Dr. Gaurav Dutra for putting it up all together with KLB, Mr. Devakar uh, for uh, doing this great show. Uh, we are grateful to our international faculty, Dr. David Chang, and we are hoping to have him again for a longer session and he's promised to do it, if I can say so. Dr. Richard Packard, who is a great friend, and uh, I'm sure we'll have him uh, again uh, in our uh, repeat webinars. And I would also like to thank Dr. Larry Benjam Benjamin. I've seen him after a long time today, and uh, it was a great presentation, especially for the residents. Then I would also uh, like to thank uh, Dr. Arun Gulani. As usual, it was a fantastic uh, presentation, you know, and a very motivational one. Uh, and the style of presenting is uh, exceptional. I mean, it cannot be copied by anyone. So I would like to thank the international faculty, the national uh, people that we have here, Dr. Partha Vishwas, the Chairman Scientific Committee, uh, Dr. Bharti, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, J.S. Titial, Dr. Rohit Shetty, uh, Dr. Nishant uh, Madhivanan, Dr. Suhas uh, Haldipurkar. And uh, we would also like to thank Dr. Mehpal Sachdev, the President of All India, uh, ophthalmological uh, society and uh, our team who's working at uh, back end uh, and Kamal Kapoor of course how can I miss him he's uh, always so vibrant he talked less today but uh, as compared to all the other uh, webinars so I would like to thank our team uh, uh, back end uh, um, uh, Mr. Sunil and Mr. Kripal Rana for putting it all together thank you very much uh, thank you Rohit and Gaurav once again thank you yeah, thank you, Rohit, sir. Thank you, uh, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Great to see you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.